Uh, well, welcome everybody to the seventh annual uh, Rare Disease Day at Sanford Burnham Previs. We are very honored and pleased that everybody's shown up today, and that's the scientists, physicians, and especially the families, because those are the biggest stakeholders. And I, what we try to do here is to build bridges between all of these different groups with the hope that all of us educating each other will give us an opportunity to advance what we all want to see, and that is treatments and possibly cures for a lot of diseases. And we're studying in this time, we're studying glycosylation disorders, human glycosylation disorders. And uh, if you look back to about uh, 1999 or so, there's a handful, three or four of these, and now there's 117. 117 diseases, rare diseases, and many of the people here know and understand firsthand what that is like and what it means to have a family member with a rare disease. The meeting we've put together today and tomorrow um, is not only a scientific lecture series in interactions, but we're interacting with the patients. We're going to have what we've called the doctor's in session uh, tomorrow afternoon where 25 families and 20 different physicians and scientists will have three hours to talk to each other. And I think this is something that is really important and something we feel we have a bit of a unique corner on for so many different disorders. And I want to especially thank uh, all of our sponsors uh, who have been very generous in providing us with the uh, wherewithal to have this meeting occur and uh, to be able to spread it more widely. And that includes um, the Grace Wilsey Foundation, Retrofin, and BioMarin, uh, who have been very generous, and the Mizutani Foundation for Glycoscience, Pfizer, Society for Glycobiology, and we have a number of other sponsors. And you'll, you'll see their logos flash up here uh, during the uh, interim times. But what I want to do is to put our rare diseases in a context as I said before, there were very few glycosylation disorders, but thanks to um, genomic sequencing, exome sequencing, we've discovered many more of them, and there are many more rare diseases that are going to be discovered over the next five, ten years. And what this means is we're going to have to figure out how that works, what happens, and that means that basic scientists are going to have the opportunity to say, that's a gene I work on. That's something I know a lot about. I can move forward and help out those patients. And if there, were, there had to be a theme for what we do and we hope to accomplish, that's it. Now, to try to put this in a broader perspective, uh, I'd like to introduce Perry Nissen, who is the CEO of Sanford Burnham Prebis, and he's an MD, PhD, uh, who can give us, a, I think, a broader perspective of what this means for all of us. Perry? Well, thanks, HUD, and thanks to all of you, the families here, the investigators, clinicians, who are all coming together to meet with each other, share your experiences, your data, your insights, your experiences. I know, and I've heard that some of you have come from as far as Japan and from Europe, so thank you for that. I'm very proud that this institute, through HUD, has really helped catalyze research in rare diseases and congenital, congenital disorders of glycosylation in particular. Uh, and I want to acknowledge HUD and his lab members. Um, they've described 18 new genetic disorders, is that right? And a few hundred cases where it was possible to make diagnosis um, his compassion and commitment, as many of you know, has been unflappable and grateful for that. Today I want to tell you I have a couple of uh, personal connections to rare disease. One, a few of you in the auditorium know uh, I'm a pediatrician, or was it my children said my dad was a pediatrician. Um, I am a pediatric hematologist, oncologist by training. And in a first career, uh, had to and engaged families with children with unknown 
diagnoses and challenges and navigating the system to try to really sort out what is this, what can we do uh, for those kids and those families is profound. The other thing that I haven't told anybody is um, I have a child with a very rare disease. My son was born with a rare syndrome. It has 20 syllables. I can't even pronounce it. <clears throat> And we struggled with that. We struggled with what it takes to come to a diagnosis, not knowing an outcome, not knowing to intervene or not. And I think the most profound impact and benefit we had was the opportunity to engage with the best and brightest uh, clinicians in the world, the best and brightest scientists in the world, and to begin to engage with families who had kids with at least similar disorders. And things have turned out pretty well for my son, but we personally experienced the challenge. So those are my close ties to that. In any case, um, we're really pleased to have the families who are here with us today, and thank you so much. I know some of you have been out in the news and speaking with others, and I've met several of these families. Um, Danny Sanford was going to be here. He may well still be here today. If he does come later, I just do want to mention, if you do have an opportunity to meet that guy, this is somebody who's devoted a career uh, to benefiting kids. He's built hospitals. He supported this uh, research center. He support is makes the reason this institute is here in part is because of his support. Um, just sort of unwavering uh, dedication and support uh, for children. So I did want to acknowledge that. And again, thank you, HUD, and thank the families, thank the scientists, and thank you for the physicians. I'm sure it's going to be an incredible couple of days. Thanks, HUD. One of my good friends always says, hang loose and be flexible. And uh, I think that's what we're going to start to experience with our um, meeting this morning. Uh, as Perry said, uh, Denny Sanford was planning on being here and welcoming everyone and tell you about how he feels about this. So Denny's running a little bit late. And if he shows up, we may... Uh, insert him into the program. We'll get him in here. We'll gong him in, if you will. So not only do we have to be flexible because of Denny, but we also have to be flexible with our uh, speakers because almost at the last moment, uh, uh, Lee Hood, who was scheduled to be one of our keynote speakers, had to cancel because of an injury that he sustained. So he can't, he can't travel. So we feel uh, uh, bad about that, but we have uh, a, a set of people who were ready at the drop of a hat to come in and, and substitute and fill in for not only him, but also Dr. Eric Eklund, who had flown in from Sweden uh, to be part of this meeting. But unfortunately, his wife got sick, and after a quick turnaround of about a day and a half, he had to go back to Sweden. So we've uh, dealt with changes, but I think if there's anything that all of us in research and in medicine, and certainly with the families, knows, you have to be ready for changes. You have to be ready for things that are unexpected. Nobody expected to have the children that they have. And that's a big difference. It's a big change. But like taking the lessons from the family, we're going to be flexible at this point. And I'm going to move into uh, introducing our first uh, keynote speaker. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have Dr. Lawrence Tabak from the National Institutes of Health uh, speaking as our first speaker today. And, and part of the reason is because I've known Larry for a very long time, and he is actually a card-carrying glycobiologist, which gives him some access to the inner circles, if you will, and so he knows about these things. Not only that, but as the uh, principal deputy director of NIH, he is uh, within hand's reach of Francis Collins. So that means if you see uh, Dr. Collins 
speaking to Congress, speaking at a presidential event, speaking at things where the NIH is front and center, Larry's there with him. So Larry has uh, a lot of perspectives, and he's going to share some of those with us today. So Larry, please. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's, it's really an honor to be here with you. Um, people often ask me what the principal deputy director of NIH does, and it's really simple. I, I do two things. Everything that the NIH director doesn't want to. <laughs> and as head of the ethics program, I tell everybody else they can't do what they do want to. And Dr. Gall, who follows me, will confirm that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> So before before beginning with my my, my remarks, I, I wanted to just take a few moments to acknowledge two very special things here. First is this extraordinary philanthropy that this institution enjoys. So NIH has a you know a checkbook of about thirty two billion dollars, and it's all of your money. It's it's the American people's money, but it's not enough. It it, it just isn't. And it's because of the generosity of philanthropists that that extra can be done. And so I really did want to acknowledge um, uh, Denny Sanford and uh, Malin Burnham and Conrad Prebus for their selflessness and, you know, their foresight in, in being able to do this. And the other person I want to acknowledge is HUD, not because we've known each other for a very, very long time. Uh, I met him when he was in kindergarten, and I was, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, today, meetings like this are not um, unusual. In fact, there, there are meetings like this around the world. When HUD began in this field and, and sort of created this space, he was all alone. I, I got to tell you. You know, he was looking behind him. It, there was nobody there. And so, HUD, thank you for the extraordinary courage and, and vision that you had back then. And look what's happened. It's just, it's just spectacular. So thank you so very, very much. <laughs> so um, let me... Uh, Tell you a little bit about NIH if this will work or not. Um, so what what am I doing wrong? I'm sorry. It's there's an on off switch. Ah, okay. So it needs to go on. Is that right? How about that? Thank you. <laughs> How many PhDs does it take to turn, or turn on a light bulb? Right. Okay. So. Um, I'd like to try and give you a, a sort of broad sense of where NIH is going as we look to the future. Um, and to do this, we, we created a strategic plan. Now, this is actually the first strategic plan that NIH as a whole has had in many, many decades. You might find that odd. But in part, it's because of the way the NIH is constructed. It consists of 27 different institutes and centers, and 24 of them have their own appropriation from the Congress. So they really are their own entities uh, with regard to decision making. The last time that NIH tried to create a strategic plan that transcended the entire agency was in 92, then Director Bernadine Healy went through the, the process of creating the plan, and it was never released because everybody got angry because it didn't reflect what they did. And the outcry was extraordinary. And I actually found a copy still in shrink wrap. It was never, it was never released. So, of course, um, much to my dismay, uh, Francis did not want to do this, and he asked me, to, to take the leadership of this. And for those of you in academia, this is sort of like being asked to be the chair of the parking committee, all right, to put together a strategic plan. But nevertheless, we've done this. And so there are a couple of things to, to know about this. First is it's a living document. 
The notion that you could create something that will be germane for an entire five years, given with the, the rapidity that science evolves, is ridiculous. So this is a living document, and we will make changes along the way, even within the five years if it becomes necessary. This plan doesn't describe all the things that NIH is doing or should do. It couldn't possibly. And it does not address the individual strategic plans of the various institutes and centers, because they have their own strategic plans. So rather, what this is is the superordinate view of what will be common across all of the institutes and centers in NIH. So this is the framework the, to, to really uh, capsule, encapsulate all of this. And as you can see, it, it really consists of three main parts an overview, um, an articulation of the various opportunities to advance biomedical research. And what's important here is the sort of virtuous cycle that occurs. Basic fundamental research begets treatments and cures, but treatments and cures also open up new fundamental questions to be asked. And similarly, fundamental <laughs> science it leads to health promotion and disease prevention, which of course in turn leads to treatments and cures, but all of these things feed back into new questions to pose. And so these are not discrete things, but rather a continuum, and in some ways artificial to describe them as, as fundamental science treatments and, and health pr promotion and disease prevention. And then the other, the remaining portion of the document talks about how NIH sets priorities and how we enhance the stewardship, the trust that the American people have given to the agency to make sure that that $32 billion is used wisely. And then finally, a pledge to excel as an agency by managing for results. In other words, we're a science agency. We're going to use science to manage the place. Novel idea, I know, but that's, that's what we, we've come up with. Now, rather than go through every single element of this, I'll just give you a couple of, of, of examples. So the overview is what you would think it is. It talks about the mission of NIH, and in particular, I'd like to emphasize the absolute unique moment of opportunity that we have today in biomedical research. And HUD has already alluded to this. Um, if you think about it, we have never been able to do as much as quickly as, as, as we can today. The era of so-called big data is, is, is upon us. About 10 years ago, I was asked to sort of give a future talk to the uh, University of California provosts. And I, I was sort of blue skying and I talked about, well, you know, within the next 10 years, we're going to have to worry about big data. And they literally laughed out loud. And I, I found out a very odd reaction, not that I I'm not never left that I am, but but it just seemed odd. But turned out they were all either physicists, astronomers, or astrophysicists. So they've been involved in big data for decades. Okay, we've caught up, largely because of genomic sequencing, but because of other types of omics, if you will. Uh, we really do now enter the big data era, and here's the the curve showing that the cost of, of DNA sequencing has dropped precipitously, now below $1,000 per sample. This has been an extraordinary catalyst, a revolution, one which, of course, very much helps the study of rare diseases and conditions. There are other omics that are important, proteomics, where you can look at protein-protein interactions. I put that up there because I thought Lee was following me, but that's fine. Um, imaging of all sorts. In this case, the image of a brain, so that we can begin to understand what the circuitry of the brain is, is up to. Um, this shows uh, a um, collaborative effort between the NIH and DARPA and the National Science Foundation, where we're making organoids on a chip, labs on a chip, so that we can begin to look at toxicity using human-derived cells and organoids rather than uh, animal models. For many animal models, the toxicity studies are no more precise than flipping a coin. But these types of approaches, we think, should be able to give you much faster results that are more accurate, thus speeding the translation of potential new interventions, which many of them fail, as you know, at the stage of toxicity. 
And then finally, there's the fact that we know so much more about the molecular underpinnings of disease. And as the example I chose, I borrowed this from your website, HUD, Congenital Disorders of Glycosylation. And um, I'm going to just take a moment, a um, little bit of an indulgence, but I'm going to just take a, a moment to talk to you about this very small class which involve uh, this uh, sugar and acetyl galactosamine, GALNAC for short, um, because I have a personal um, attachment to that. So when you look at the opportunities to advance biomedical research, one of the things that we emphasize to members of Congress and their staff all the time is that when you do basic science, serendipity is a really, really important facet. I have to tell you, members of Congress don't want to hear that. They want to give you $10, and they want to know that they got $10 worth of stuff today. But that's not the way basic science works. And those of you who are basic scientists know this. You sort of shake your heads. Consequences are often unpredictable. And so I'd like to just give you a quick example of that, because uh, HUD mentioned I'm a card-carrying glycobiologist. At least that's what my last Board of Scientific Council's review said, so uh, at least for the next four years. So back in 1990, this is what we knew about a type of glycosylation, mucin type O glycosylation. Now you may wonder, what is a dentist, because my clinical training is in dentistry, dealing with mucin type O glycosylation? Well, the thing that makes saliva spit, that ooey gooey property, are the mucin glycoproteins in the saliva. And that's actually where I began to study these things. Well, what we knew was is that proteins are decorated with sugar. This type of glycosylation is very simple. It occurs one sugar at a time, step by step by step. It's actually kind of boring relative to the fancy end glycosylation that most people here study. And the first step in this process is the, is, is, is the attachment of this N-acetylgalactosamine, this galnac, to a serine or a threonine residue of the protein backbone. And at the time in 1990, we figured, well, there's this transferase, and it moves the sugar from the sugar donor, and that's the end of the story. Very simple. Well, this uh, picture is Fred Hagen standing in a cold room. He stood in that cold room for about two and a half years. And <laughs> he was from Manitoba, so it was okay. It was just like home. <laughs> And he came out a multimillionaire, meaning that he purified a gly this glycosyl transferase, the homogeneity, 2.2 million fold. 2.2 million fold, okay? And that gave him enough of that material to sequence a part of it the old-fashioned way, something called Edmund degradation. Okay, all of you have no idea what I just said. Google it. You will find out that it used to be the way you sequence proteins. And that allowed us to clone for the first time this transferase. And so I figured, great, we have a nice little paper, and now we're done. And then I made the mistake of doing an additional experiment. And the experiment was to do a test to see where the messenger RNA that encodes this glycosyl transferase lies in, 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 in tissues. And we took a bunch of, of uh, organs and, and tissue parts where we knew that mucins were abundant and we figured we'd find signal in all of them. And sure enough, uh, here it is in the heart and the brain and the liver and so This is lung. This is lung. And there's no signal there. So what do you do when you get a result that you can't explain? Well, those of you who work in labs know, you, you blame the technician. <laughs> right? And so, and so we went to poor Christine Gregoire, and we said, Christine, what did you do? How, how could you possibly have left that sample out? I, redo it. And, of course, she did, and we got the same result. And so then, of course, what do you do next? You go to the postdoc, Fred Hagen, and you say, Fred, you know, Christine's lost her mind. Something's going on here. Well, finally, what we realized, of course, is that this 
experiment, this unexpected finding, was telling us something very, very important. It was telling us there were other forms of this enzyme. That we, there were more than one of them. And so as a result, first my lab and then Henrik Clausen's lab in Denmark and then uh, Narimatsu's lab in Japan started a sort of race. It's usually friendly, sometimes not so friendly, where we each cloned and, and expressed and characterized the various isoforms, including T3, which Dr. Gall will tell you a little bit about because it's is the molecular underpinnings of a rare genetic disease, tumoral calcinosis. This is where T3 came from as a result of a whole series of studies showing that there were many, many, many different isoforms. When we started the work, there was no way we would have known that, but that serendipity led us to something which now helps explain human disease, and that's why you have to be patient when it comes to fundamental research. Now, Breakthroughs need partnerships, and these often come from unexpected directions. And so I just wanted to highlight very briefly the NIH's Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. Um, right now, we have 22 consortia at over 250 institutions worldwide, and they focus on at least three rare diseases at each of these sites. They participate in multi-site studies, so we're able to take full advantage and leverage existing infrastructure. Um, and of course, as, as you have all been doing for many years here uh, under, under HUD's leadership, it actively involves patient advocacy groups as partners. Currently, there are over 80 protocols studying over 200 diseases. More than 85 patient advocacy groups are participating, and then just, just gives you an example of the many groups that, that are engaged in this. And increasingly, NIH is doing this more and more, because unless you have this dialogue, you can't optimize what, what the effort is in order to solve these diseases and conditions. If you're interested, you can interrogate that website, and it will give you much, much more information. Now. I don't have to tell this group how important it is to study rare diseases and conditions, but you would be amazed at how many times a year I am asked by members of Congress or their staff, why is not NIH just spending all its money based upon disease burden? So cardiovascular disease is the greatest burden the most people die from it. You should be spending all your money on that. And if there are diseases or conditions that afflict only hundreds or thousands of people, you know, that shouldn't be a high priority. And we are constantly making the argument that that's just not going to be on the table for two important reasons. One, and again, you all know this each and every day, if you have the disease or condition, it's not rare at all. And that usually stops the staff or the members in their tracks. But the other thing, and again, something that I know that this group broadly appreciates, is that what you learn from studying a rare disease or condition invariably informs a more common disease and condition as well. And so there are really two very strong reasons why we need to do a, a rare disease network that he is intimately uh, involved with and in leading. But I'll just point out uh, another example, trend, therapeutics for rare and neglected diseases. The idea here is to speed up translational research. And what it does is it's a collaboration between NIH labs and extramural labs. Projects can enter at any stage of development. Um, it's taken to the stage needed to extract external organizations to adopt for the final clinical development. Um, and it encourages creative partnerships and novel approaches to intellectual property, which, which unfortunately sometimes do, do get a bit in the way. Um, th an example of this, there are many, um, a, a, a development of a potential treatment for neiman pick type uh, C1 disease. Um, this is a, a, a horrible neurodegenerative condition um, with uh, lipid accumulating in, in the brain of individuals who, who are so affected. Um, and uh, the, the whole idea was to try and um, work through um, a derivative of cyclodextrin to, to serve as a treatment. 
Um, and so the uh, yellow uh, represents the lipid accumulation uh, in fibroblasts derived from uh, these, these patients. Uh, but in the presence of, of the uh, therapeutic intervention, you can see a lessening um, of this. Um, this has led to a support for a phase one trial, uh, which began at the NIH Clinical Center. Um, the FDA took hold of this, um, speeding uh, the use of this. Um, and, and this is the way it's supposed to work, where the government partners with the patient groups, where the patient groups partner with the researchers, this is the way you know it needs to work to maximize um, you know progress going forward. And so partnerships are the next thing I like to talk about. It's one of our main stewardship principles. We've got to enhance our impact through partnerships, and and the American people are our most important partners. You are our most important partners. Without individuals who are willing to be participants, who are willing to be partners, no progress can be made in anything that we're doing in biomedical research. And, and we can never say this enough. Now, yesterday, uh, timing is everything. I wouldn't have been able to be here if it was today. Yesterday, the president announced the, the status of the Precision Medicine Initiative cohort, which is, it aims to enroll one million or more U.S. volunteers. Um, again, if you want more information about this, please interrogate this website. It involves engaging participants. It involves the use of electronic health records, which have become increasingly more uh, widely used. Uh, all sorts of smartphone technologies. How many of you are wearing one of these things that tells you steps or pulse or around here, I think lots of people do. It's amazing that you all look so much, much healthier, I guess, as a result. Um, you know, genomics, which of course is an engine for, for many of this, but then the whole point of data science, being able to put all these things together. So this precision medicine research cohort will broadly reflect the diversity of the U.S., including ages, health status, areas of the country. We will put a strong emphasis on those groups who are typically underrepresented in, in, in efforts of this type. It's designed to be longitudinal with continuing interactions. We'll collect electronic health record data. There will be uh, provision to collect biospecimens, do surveys, and a baseline exam. And there's two ways you can get involved with this. One is through direct volunteerism, anyone can sign up, and the other is through various healthcare provider organizations, including federally qualified healthcare centers. And so this will allow us to, continue to consider the diversity of all the participants and so forth as we assemble this opportunity. The core values are articulated here. We want to open it to anybody who's interested. We want it to represent the rich diversity of our nation. Participants are partners. They are not patients. They are not subjects. Strike that from your lexicon, please, everybody. They are our partners in all phases of the program, and indeed in all things that NIH is doing going forward. Participants will have access to study information and data about themselves as much or as little as you want. Some people want to know everything. I'm married to a person like that. Other people don't want to know anything. She's married to a person like that. <laughs> We've been married over 41 years. It sort of worked itself out, okay? But, but and, all, and anything in between is okay. The project will adhere to privacy principles and, and a security network. Data will be able to be accessed broadly, de-identified, of course. Um, and then finally, we want this to serve as a catalyst for future progressive research and, and policy development. Now, there are many, 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 many examples of things that could be done with this. I'm just going to give you a few. You can develop some quantitative estimates of risk for a range of diseases by looking at environmental exposures and genetic factors simultaneously. You can identify causes of individual variation in response to commonly used therapeutics, okay? 
um, you know, you're all taking your meds based upon 100, okay? And, and we've got to get better than that. Um, we need to develop and discover more biological markers that reveal increased or de de decreased risk of developing common disease. We've got to understand and address the causes of health disparities. The use of mobile health technologies will help us correlate activity, physiologic members, environmental exposures with health outcomes. We want to develop new disease classifications and relationships that make more sense, that help inf inform therapy in a more rational way. We want to empower study participants with data and information so that you can improve your own health. And we want to create a platform to enable trials of targeted therapeutics more rapidly to speed things to discovery so that we get things into your homes as quickly as possible. Then there's a the whole issue of rigor and reproducibility. When we do science, we want it to be reproducible. We want it to be rigorous. There has been a whole cry recently in both the lay and scientific community about this. When members of Congress start reading about this in the Wall Street Journal, we get phone calls. We get go down to the Congress to say what's going on. Um, and, and so particularly important are these issues in preclinical research. That is the use of the animal model, which is the antecedent to the first in human clinical trial. And many of you I know are engaged in work of that type. Um, Francis and I uh, put together a commentary over a year ago now. The most important thing that we said in that commentary was efforts by NIH alone will not be sufficient to affect change in, um, in, this, in this environment. NIH can't do it alone. We need everybody. We need all stakeholders to be involved. And wearing another hat, HUD with, with, with the FACIP, uh, has really been very helpful in, in, in this regard. Um, we've, we've had a series of publications talking about the need to balance sex in both cell and animal studies. It's the only time I get to talk about sex in any of my talks. Um, and the notion of cell lines, do you know what your cell line really is? For those of you who use cell lines, a little bubble just went over your heads, um, and, and, and so forth. Um, we've done a workshop with journal editors to identify common opportunity areas. So far, over 135 journals have endorsed principles which have been broadly shared. Um, the, the, the concept of getting 40 editors in a room and have them agree to anything is daunting, but we were able to do that. And, and I think science will be better uh, for it. Um, we've got to enhance training. Um, NIH has put out um, a number of uh, video vignettes that can be downloaded freely for institutions around the country to use as part of a training approach. Um, NIGMS, one of the institutes at NIH, is also supporting development of more formalized training modules. Again, these will go on the web. Anybody can use them around the world. Um, and then the, in, the intramural research program held a series of workshops on data interpretation so we brought the real luminaries in the field, not to talk about their great cutting edge science, but to talk about how their cutting edge technology can be misunderstood, misinterpreted. So all I can tell you is, if any of you are using FRET, be very afraid. That's all I will tell you. You should interrogate this website and look at these videos. It's really fascinating. Uh, they, used, they talked about optical techniques, they talked about mass spectrometry, they talked about calling DNA sequence, a non-trivial issue, I'm sure. Uh, but, but really, you should take a look and hear what the absolute experts in the world have to say about this. And NIH is now changing the way we are doing uh, grant submission and review, in particular to talk about um, rigorous experimental design, the need to consider sex and other relevant biological variables, and applications submitted as of the 25th of January needed to adhere to these new approaches. Then, of course, there's the need to share openly a dialogue with the scientific community. And so the, the PubMed Commons is a way we're doing this. This is not like the letter to the editor 
where you begin by saying, I read with great interest Professor So-and-So's article and then proceed to trash it. This is instead an attempt at honest dialogue of forwards and backwards discussion. And if you haven't looked at PubMed Commons, take a look. Um, you'll find that some of the discussion is quite interesting. It's led to collaborations. It's led to new studies. Um, it, it, it's, it's still nascent in that there aren't many people participating, but those that are participating find it to be a very useful experience. And other organizations are now getting on, on, on this uh, uh, train as well. Um, this is a faculty of 1,000, uh, which now has a channel to discuss uh, reproducibility of studies that have been published previously. And so other organizations are now um, getting, getting involved. Well, that was uh, finally, you know, to excel as a federal science agency for managing for results. Um, we're, we are spending a fair amount of time trying to develop the science of science, uh, how we use science to make decisions at NIH, um, to develop new analytical approaches. Um, it's, it's really difficult as, as people who, who oversee research portfolios to, to, to objectively judge what's, what's good, bad, or interesting. And, and that's because we're very good at measuring outputs, how many publications, how many citations the publications got, what journals the publications are in, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't tell you anything, oh, by the way, about whether or not the work has an impact whether or not the work leads to anything that's important. And sometimes that can take a hundred years before you know. And I know none of you want to hear that, but that's the reality. And so we're trying very hard to figure out more clever ways of assessing long-term success of grants and to see if there's any correlation between different types of novel short-term outputs versus long-term outcomes. Here's a couple of things that we've, we've been working on, something called the relative citation ratio. It's a new metric that uses citation rates to measure influence at an article level. We think that it, it is a far uh, uh, more robust way of describing the potential impact of a publication. And then here's something that we're doing with all institutes and centers, uh, displaying transparently for, the, for all to see in the public uh, how they are awarding grants um, versus the percentile score that they receive. And what you can see is that it's not rogue. It's not just down the pay line that there are skips and so forth. And we think that it's important for all stakeholders to, to know this. Well, with that, I will stop. I don't know if you built in any time for questions. Yes. But I, again, I, I do a, a appreciate the, the honor of, of opening up this session, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or listen to any feedback you may have. So thank you. Questions for Larry? Yes, sir. Henry. As someone who launched his scholarship at NIH way back when, uh, I'd like to point out one of the awards. And one of the wards at NIH, and that's the uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. Uh, surely you recognize that all research is not equal, and all disciplines are not equal. And the benefit of serendipity does not apply equally to all research. Now, you've described some of the superb things that NIH does, intramurally and extramurally. But in the 21st century, the NIH should not be funding uh, clinical trials on cranberry juice in urinary tract infections and uh, yoga to treat cancer. Uh, and uh, so my message is that you and Francis should have the courage to broach this with uh, the secretary's office and with congressional committees at every opportunity so you can use those funds for real research that benefit people instead of politically correct rubbish. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, as a pediatrician, I, I see a lot of work. Um, I'll take the phone, sorry. 
As a pediatrician, I see a lot of uh, work on big data and volunteer programs that are very important, but uh, um, aren't going to be um, teaching us much about children and how they grow and how all of these things change as, as children are growing. And so I'm, I'm interested in what you see as uh, big data um, progresses, how we can extrapolate that information and actually um, become partners with children who aren't allowed to partner with us. Yeah, so no, you, you, you bring up a, a gap for sure. One thing that we are in the midst of uh, setting up is something called ECHO. Um, you, you may be familiar with the, the National Children's Study, which unfortunately needed to be terminated. Um, it just was going down a wrong path. We were fortunate to have Congress uh, provide us with that resource set um, for ECHO, which is, which is replacing um, that effort. And what we're doing there is we are taking advantage of existing cohorts, which consist of either women who are of childbearing age and or cohorts that already have enrolled children, but lack the resources to do the longitudinal study in depth, studying things from a broad range of environment, meaning the chemical environment, biological environment, um, socioeconomic status, psychological environment, and so forth, together with genetics, together with the other elements, to try and put this all together in one massive database that can be interrogated as a function of time. The initial award period will be seven years, which is seven more years than we now you know, are able to look at. And the hope is, is that if this proves to be successful and can be renewed, now you're up to 14 years. And so, you know, the math you know, is obviously easy. So it's, for, it's doing things like this. Also, the Precision Medicine Initiative will eventually enroll families, children. That's another way that we will be able to see what is absolutely missing right now. So I, I do appreciate you drawing that one out. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the struggles that my colleagues and I uh, have as clinical uh, geneticists is, as you all have said, the uh, diagnostic odyssey that uh, exists um, that can take many years. And uh, we have huge challenges in terms of getting um, sequencing test authorization uh, up to 5 to 10 percent of my time and a third of the time of our division's genetic counselors may be dealing with this barrier. Right. And it, with the cost of whole exome sequencing, I, I would say with careful phenotypic um, description, uh, I have up to 50 percent. Um, I mean, the mutation makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea, you know, what the child might or might not have. So, you know, finally, if the NIH was able to, in the context of markedly decreasing costs per person for a whole exome, that could be very good in terms of the big data and amassing um, these really critical things, because there'll, there'll be patients who are not going to volunteer, parents, because they, they may not know about this. Sure. Right. No, thank you. And, and, and again, you, you are also a student pointing out a gap, one that we, we hope be, begins to be uh, redressed with, with efforts like PMI and so forth. Uh, Bill, I, you, you may have a comment you know, about this, because you live this. This is you know, what you do. Well, it's difficult for the NIH to actually interface with insurance companies, which reimburse for those things. But uh, exome sequencing is coming around, you know, for, for one thing. And I think the insurance companies are recognizing that at $1,000 or at $3,000 for a family, and it's actually a little less than that uh, or, or so, that's better, uh, that's a less expensive than getting anesthesia for a muscle biopsy, which could cost five, ten thousand dollars or so. So I do think that things are changing somewhat. And I think if you have real mysteries, there's also the undiagnosed disease network that I'm going to mention that uh, really will provide that for free. But you're right, we're not there yet. 
Right. And, and I guess I was too obtuse. So through PMI, hopefully groups like CMS will, will get to a point which is more conducive to what you're you know, hoping for. Other questions or comments? Yes, please. I know you mentioned working with some of the medical journal editors. I didn't know if there were any efforts to try to make some of the articles more readable for <laughs> parents or laymen, because I'm one of those people who wants to know and understand it, and it's frustrating to to not be able to always understand it. And Yeah, you know, th that's a very important point, and very few journals ask for a lay summary. Um, some journals in the sort of synopsis approach that. I'm not aware. I mean, none of the FASIP journals do that. I don't no, think. No, yeah. uh, That's no. That's interesting, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Burnham Previs, when we have an article that's written, oftentimes actually Susan, who's sitting behind me, will summarize that article in right. layman's term on right. our blog post, the right. speaker. Yeah, the high profile stuff is, is, is certainly in that way. A lot of times that but, may be a source for yeah. but, but thank you for raising that. That's interesting. Yeah. The other ways. One of the other ways to do that, which we've not done well in the parent support groups for CDGs, but fatty acid or, um, oxidation, organic acidemia group, urea cycle group all have newsletters for families. And very often they will ask for a scientist or a clinician to write an article specifically on a topic that's been covered in the journals in layman's terms for their audience. So if that's a need, I think you should go to the family organization and say, hey, you know, I read this paper, I didn't understand these concepts, is there a way for us to get a layman's version? I, I guess the final thing I would add, um, it's happened to me maybe three or four times, which is not a lot in my career. I've had patients write me as, you know, you wrote this paper, could you maybe clarify or explain? And let me tell you something. Scientists love to talk about their work. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to turn you down. <laughs> but but so that's that's another option, of course. Uh, Larry, one one final question. What do you think we as basic scientists can do to uh, improve the situation, both in terms of funding? I mean, obviously we do our work in the lab. But is there something else we can do to, to confront these things head on? Yeah, so again, you don't realize how powerful each and every one of you is in this room. I, I go to Congress all the time because I'm a federal employee and I represent the administration. And so they, they sort of listen to me, but they, it's through that filter of, oh yeah, he's, you know, he's the administrator's, you know, you know, the president's guy. And, but all of you are represented by members of Congress. Please, 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 whatever your view is, I'm not going to tell you what your view should be. That's your business. Meet with your member. And don't, and, and as much as we'd love to have you visit Washington, because it's a lovely place, although not nearly as lovely as this place. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way, visit with them when they're in their home districts. They're more relaxed. They have a little bit more time. They're likely to meet with you directly as opposed to meeting with one of their staffers and state your case, whatever your case is. Now, in the case of basic research, we're constantly trying to explain why basic research is the engine that fuels all that comes after it. But again, I don't want to you know, tell you what the message should be, but I will tell you, you should at least deliver your message, whatever it is, to your respective member of, of the Congress. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Larry. So welcome to session one. My name is Bob Haltewanger. I'll be chairing this session. I'm from the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center at the University of Georgia. Um, our first speaker uh, in this session is uh, Xingfang uh, Jen from uh, Agios Pharmaceuticals in Boston. Uh, the title of her talk is A Mouse Model Mimicking PMMT, PMM2 CDG. Xingjian. 
All right, can you guys hear me? Uh, good, good morning, everyone. I guess I'm the first speaker from industry from a biotech company in Boston. Um, it's a, a privilege and pleasure to be here today and talk with you about some of our research. I want to thank Hart for inviting me here to give the presentation, and also I want to thank him for the guidance throughout the project. Uh, and without him, we wouldn't have uh, reached where we are today. So I am a basic research scientist um, working in a pharmaceutical small biotech company. Uh, before I talk about the basic science, uh, a novel mouse model mimicking human PMM2 CDG, I wanted to give you a very quick overview about what is Agios and what we do so that I can set up a backdrop for, for you to understand where this small piece of research lies. All right, see if I can get this work. Yes. So um, Agios is a company founded about seven years ago by three brilliant scientists that some of you may not know already, Tech Mac, Craig Thompson, and Luke Anthony. We founded based on um, cancer metabolism. And in the last two to three years, we branched out to rare genetic diseases. And we are a company driven by clear vision and values. And we are passionately committed to the fundamental transformation of patients' lives through scientific leadership in the field of cancer metabolism and rare genetic disorders of metabolism. And we are building a great sustainable pharmaceutical company. We founded the company, Open the Door, in 2009. And I am one of the very, very few early scientists joined the company. Actually, I am the third scientist, a basic research scientist. So it's very exciting to watch the company grow over the last seven years. So very quickly, within six to nine months, we uh, scientists at Argios discovered the IDH mutation can cause cancer. And that seminal discovery is published in Nature. And that really sets the tone, sets the stage about what we do that's different from other companies, which is we really focus on basic and fundamental understanding of the disease before we can make a medicine that can really transform and really cure the disease. And shortly after, we uh, formed the alliance with Celgene that helped us to have some cash flow to increase and sustain our drug discovery research and basic science. And we have put five medicines in human clinical trial in the last short few years. And each one of the small molecules were bona fide drugs made by agile scientists. And those are innovative, innovative um, small molecules that's first in class and has never been studied before, those uh, disease targets. So the first two molecules, ID is against mutated versions of IDH1 and IDH2 for AML for liquid tumors and as, as well as for a variety of different Sony tumors. So today there are patients who are alive before um, because of our uh, uh, innovative study from a basic concept, from a piece of DNA, from a protein to all the way to medicine to humans. And we also have a small molecule activator and stabilizer against a mutated enzyme in red blood cells called pyruvic kinase R. And this medicine is in clinical trial for anemia, and I spoke with a few of you about that already. And that medicine can increase ATP levels in red cells, and we are going to initiate a beta thalassemia clinical trial as well. Because of this success, we uh, studied cancer metabolism and, and branch, branched out to rare genetic disease. That's when I started to read literature to see what are the other rare genetic diseases that uh, could be of interest and we could potentially help patients. So um, again, um, it's under that backdrop we are studying PMM2 CDG disease. So that is within a exploratory biology research in early, a very early stage of the company's endeavor. <clears throat> And uh, today we have more than 200 people in the company. Uh, we are build, uh, build, maturing into a late stage company. Uh, we are building late stage development and commercial um, capabilities. So that's a whole new branch of, uh, of expansion in the small biotech company. But what is gratifying is that we have stayed true to science, to the core uh, technology we built in the beginning. 
um, we are continuing to expand our basic research that includes some of the very early research and um, PMM2 CDG is one of the basic biology project in my group of scientists. So I had the rare genetic disease biology team at Agios. So when I first started thinking about PMM2 CDG, I read a few papers. I found that Haas name is everywhere. So I called him up. I said, hey, how can, can you help me to understand the disease? I also reached out to a few people in the audience to t try to talk with you about what is this disease. So um, as a, a read the literature, we see, we see that this mutation, PMM2, um, uh, because mutation, the cells cannot convert mannose 6-phosphate to mannose 1-phosphate. That causes a decreased levels of GDP mannose and donico-linked oligosaccharides, and also altered levels of glycosinated protein. See, I use the word altered because some of them may be higher, some of them might be lower because of the uh, abnormal glycosylation. I circled three red circles here because those are the uh, main um, measurements we have done in our model system, in vitro and in animal models. Um, because many of you know this disease, I don't need to do any um, further introduction. Uh, but what I do want to, to share with you is that there is currently no cure. So I want to focus the word cure, and that's what we wanted to achieve at Agios. And uh, there's no cure yet, and hope, uh, hopefully uh, some of us here can help to achieve that at some, uh, in the near future. And also, as a basic research scientist, it's very important to me that there is no viable mouse model and available to uh, for preclinical testing or to test future potential therapeutics. And when we start to think about how to build the mouse model, what I wanted to do is build a model that is relevant to human disease, that's, that's um, uh, represent the most prevalent, prevalent human mutations. And we know that PMM2 mutation happens throughout the protein. There are probably 500 of different mutations. There are, however, hot sparse mutations. So there are two mutations. One is at amino acid 141. The other is at amino acid 119. As you can see, this is a, uh, the, uh, the highest frequency uh, mutations hot spot in the gene. And also through the vast literature, we know that the compound heterozygous, as, as Bill said very nicely, the bi bianionic mutation, that's also the most frequent in human patients. And there are the mutations homozygous 141 has nearly undetectable enzymatic activity, and this mutation is incompatible with life. So humans with PMM2 CDG, they always have some level of residual enzymatic activity. So that's very, very uh, important to remember in a second why that's important. Now, the mouse protein is about um, four amino acids shorter than humans. So the equivalent of the mouse mutation of the human is at residue 137 and residue 115. Now I highlighted these two in red and to make it easier for us to follow. And that is the compound halozygous that we are going to focus on. Now, through uh, classic mouse genetics, which I will not go into details, and then that took us about a year and a half to accomplish, we are able to create um, heterozygous mouse that carry a single anneal mutation at amino acid 137 or a single anneal mutation at amino acid 115. By crossing these mice in this experiment, we can create potential four different outcomes of the genotype, wild type, heterozygous 137 and heterozygous 115, as well as compound heterozygous. And we all know from literature research that uh, these, the equivalent of the genotypes in humans are asymptomatic, and the equivalent of the human patients in this compound heterozygous are symptomatic. Of course, you can imagine other types of crossing as well, where you can cross 137 um, heterozygous with 137. You can potentially look at the um, existence of uh, homozygous 137, and same is true for 115. And we did do those experiments. And due to time constraints, I will only talk about the compound heterozygous, which represent the most prevalent human compound heterozygous. So the question is whether this class of mouse we have made here can mimic human disease. 
Now, uh, showing here again is the compound heterozygous, they exhibit pre and postnatal death and growth defects. And this table shows the genotype of uh, the mouse breeding experiments I just mentioned to you about. So based on mundane distribution, we would expect 25% of the wild type and 50% of uh, heterozygous and 25% of uh, compound heterozygous if that obeys the mundane law. So in our huge mouse genetic experiment where we have bred more than 80 different breedings obtained over 600 mice, in this mouse, we see significantly decreased percentage of the compound heterozygous. You can see we have less than 10% in here. Uh, in, you know, even though we expect to see 25% if based on Montana law. So there is prenatal growth defect, uh, pre, uh, sorry, prenatal uh, defects in lethality here. In order to find out at which stage of the embryogenesis then this lethality happens, we look at the and the embryos at different DPCs, without going through all the details, we figured out that uh, the embryonic lethality happens somewhere after uh, DPC 12 and a half and mm -hmm. before the animals are born. And, and we also try to treat these animals um, before mating all the way through until the babies are born to see if mammals can rescue the uh, uh, prenatal embryonic lethality. The answer is no. For this particular genotype, mammals pretreatment cannot rescue the, uh, the, 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 the lethality. So because of time constraints, what I didn't uh, show here is the embryonic lethality of homozygous 115-115, and these animals can be helped by manual supplementation prenatally. Okay. So now this um, compound heterozygous in red, they were born. So we followed about 57 of these animals. This is the uh, survival postnatal. As you can see, at day six, by day 65, about 50% of these animals died already. Well, compared to the wild type and heterozygous control, they are perfectly normal. They all survived. And uh, we also follow the growth curve. In here, each dot represents a, a body weight of each a single animal. The x-axis is the uh, day postnatal. The y-axis is body weight. You can focus on the red dot again. Compound heterozygous animals, they grow significantly slower compared to the nitamate control of a wild type or um, heterozygous. So in this same experiment, we also try to use mannose supplementation to see if postnatally mannose supplementation can make a difference, can rescue this growth defect. And unfortunately, the answer is no. And here is a picture showing the smaller size of compound heterozygous. So the failure of mannose supplementation rescue postnatally also applies to um, the 115 um, homozygous animals, which we didn't show here. Now, uh, then we wanted to see whether these animals have any additional defects. So we, we observed a varied postnatal physical defects. So these animals are generally slower and they are less alert and they are less steady. You can see, watch them walk. And also we observed some very easily observable um, defects by naked eye. For example, hind leg hypotonia, eye problems, and also spinal curvature and atax ataxia. And by using 2D micro CT scan, you can see the uh, a spinal curvature defect more obviously. So not all animals have this defect and the severity also vary from animals to animals. Um, so this compound health has exhibit a very broad spectrum of disease presentations and very significant heterogeneity. And that's very similar to what the doctors observe in clinic. I think some of the doctors sitting in the audience perhaps can chime me if that's indeed what they see. And then um, by a more close-up um, look, we use a 3D micro CT scan to look at the, we observed the cranial and spinal development defects. 
I'm showing here is the defect in uh, of kyphosis and the defect in defective development in cervical spine, uh, that's the joint between the leg and the spine, and also a failure of closure of posterior frontal and also lower bone mineral, de mineral density. So uh, next, we want to figure out whether these mice have altered levels of disease-relevant plasma biomarkers. I think some of you are, are doctors and clinicians in the audience might remember that in your patient's diagnosis, you have observed decreased levels of certain plasma biomarkers, that including antithrombin-3, IGF-1, and IGF-BP-3. Sure enough, we were able to recapitulate that in our animal models, showing here each single dot is, an, um, is a mouse patient. And this data has been reproduced multiple times to ensure data reproducibility and quantity. Once again, showing in red is compound heterozygous, and the black is a wild type, and the blue, uh, the litimate uh, heterozygous controls. So one additional uh, protein that is the acylamyl subunit <coughs> ALAS, ALS, that is the uh, a factor in uh, in the IG1, IGF1 complex. The level is also significantly decreased, as you can see by this Western blood. This is a blinded study. So on the top, you can see the red bars represent a cell, um, plasma from the compound heterozygous animals, and the others are controls. So you can see nearly absent levels of ALAS in this um, model. And all these are consistent with uh, human patients. What is not consistent is this transferring level. And we know that mouse transferring has one N-glycan, and human have two N-glycan trees. And this, uh, we observe normal levels transferring. And perhaps this is not surprising because based on Haas publication in MPI, hypomorphic mouse, and also a prior publication by a German group, uh, by Schneider et al., uh, the transfer level is also normal in their PMM2 models. And very excitingly, we also discovered additional novel biomarkers, and that's through very extensive basic biology research. And that's what our scientists strive to do. We want to find what's new and what's not published in literature. We want to contribute to the scientific community understanding of the disease. So by looking at a, a very large cohort of plasma proteins, we identified a few, and these are the few represented here, that's changed in the disease model. One is penetrexin-3, that's N-glycosylated, and that's a marker for inner immunity. And we know that these patients are prone for inflammation, uh, infection. And the other is IGFBP1, that's O-glycosylated, and level is significantly higher. So if you look at these uh, body blots, you can see some of the um, uh, glycosylated protein level is lower, some of them becomes higher. So we use, uh, the, the level is not always lower. And also the degree of change is different. Some of them change is more is about 30 to 50 or percent change, and very similar to human patients. But however, the, this one, IGF1, the, the, the fold change is very dramatic over 10 fold change. And this has not been observed in human patients. I would encourage doctors and clinicians in this room, please take a look at your patients, whether you see the change of these proteins and which could potentially can help your diagnosis as well, in addition to DNA sequencing. Now, we want to take an even closer look in these animals by looking at their cells. So we took the cells from these animals, the MAPs, the embryonic fibroblasts, and compared them with the human PMM2 patient fibroblasts. And the PMM2 patient fibroblasts were received from Haas lab, and thanks, Bobby, for sending us all the cells. And uh, so we were able to reproduce some of the data that's published by Haas and his lab and some of the other researchers in this audience. So showing on the left is the cells from these animals. Again, these were color-coded, focused on the red, which is compound heterozygous. The others were control wild type and, um, and heterozygous. 
and they have reduced PMM specific activity and similar to in the human patient cells. And those cells have a wide variety of specific mutations that's including the 141, 119 mutation in this cell, 168. Now, we also look at the other features that has been published in the literature, which is the donico-linked oligosaccharide. And we, again, we learned that uh, trick from Hart and his lab. Uh, we hope to reproduce this very nicely. And again, we see a similar uh, defect as we see in human PMM2 patients. And same is true for the total cellular GDP mannose level by LCMS. As I, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, we're a company focused focus on metabolism. So we are very proficient in doing LCMS and now GCMS to do quantitation. And we also look at the global manosylation by radioactive manose incorporation into latently made um, proteins. You can see also decreased levels and, and compared to human um, cells as well. That's what we see here. So now we have characterized the mouse model and also look at the uh, mouse cells. And we look at the uh, deficiency in vitro and in vivo. And I believe we have just made a collection of very useful tools for uh, drug discovery companies to leverage to um, discover therapeutics against these uh, patients. And that's what we really need to do. Now, think about therapeutics. What can we do? Can we restore the enzymatic activity of PMM2, or can we do something else to change the pathway flow and make a difference in patients' lives? So one of the very um, simple um, thing to think about is because it's mutated and because the patients always have residual enzymatic activity. So can we stabilize and increase the enzymatic activity and, and help them? So that's one of the very straightforward um, thinking. And also Agios Pharmaceuticals has luck in one of its prior program, which I mentioned to you earlier, which is mutation in the pyruvate kinase R gene, that enzyme has decreased the ability and decreased enzymatic activity, and we were able to identify small molecule chaperones to increase the stability and increase enzymatic activity of that mutant enzyme. So the thinking is along the same lines, where if you overexpress the wild-type PMM2 in patient fibroblast cells, can you restore the defect that you can measure? The answer is yes. We can restore GDP mannose concentration in the, in the fibroblast cell if we overexpress PMM2, as Hart and his uh, um, colleagues have seen, and also the uh, DLO level, and also the global mannosylation. And in addition, we want to see if this can restore other features, specifically the individual N-glycosylated protein. So showing here is ICAM1 that's induced by TNF-alpha. You can see ICAM1 level can be restored because, um, due to PMM2 uh, restoration, and that's have been shown by Bobby and, and Hart and others. Um, and very interesting, there is a larval glycosylation protein, GP130, that is a co-receptor for IL-6, and that has not, not been uh, published or discovered before. And again, um, this is the many, among many different glycosylated protein that we study, and we found this defect. And restoration um, um, of the uh, PMM2 expression in these cells can restore GP130 protein levels to the wild type level. So um, the restoration of PMM2 pathway activity by overexpression of this wild type enzyme provides the proof concept that reactivation of the defective gene, the defective enzyme, may be a viable therapeutic approach. Of course, some of us Yes, I have two more minutes, I'm done, yeah. Um, so gene therapy potentially can be another potential and that's more difficult to um, deliver the uh, genes in every single cell of the body, but small molecule may have the potential. So this finished my presentation. And uh, so we have made a mouse model, my mimic human disease, and you have seen that uh, they have partial prenatal and postnatal lethality, and the viable offsprings allow us to dissect the disease that different from what's published by Schneider. Uh, uh, the mice they, they generated are completely lethal, and that does not allow disease characterization. And in addition, we have have look at the, the cells from these mice and compare it to the human cells, and these recapitulate each other very well. 
Now, um, comp uh, looking at therapeutics for PMMCD-CDG, we mentioned the restoration of a defective enzyme, and the second approach would be inhibition of MPI, and HART and NAP have screened um, inhibition against MPI protein. What I didn't describe here is that in the hypomorphic mouse model, if we were to uh, decrease the activity of MPI and breed these mice with PMM2 mice, that can potentially help us by men uh, together with men. I want, I want to thank all the four organizations and their uh, scientists in participating in this study, which made the talk possible today. And thank you for your attention. Do we have time for one quick question? Have you looked to see if uh, the mice have an increased uh, 1124 M over Z glycan, which is seen in uh, human patients along with some other CDGs? And then the second, uh, you might want to try giving metformin to the mice, like a plus and minus, because we know metformin pumps in glucose. That's how it can take care of type 2 diabetes. Yes. And uh, the pump, the uh, cell receptor that works with the sulfurea moonlights with mannose, even though it's primarily glucose. That way you might be able to achieve higher intracellular concentration. This is something that Thorsten in Germany had proposed, but I've never seen anything published about it. I think Hal has a comment. I'll wait for him to come on first. Do you want to comment, Hal? Looks like he wants to say something. <laughs> You know, I think those uh, those data are still uh, the kind of things that maybe work, but at the moment there's no clinical evidence that mannose works in PMM2 patients. The other um, uh, thing you talked about, the uh, extra glycan, is very, very slightly elevated in PMM2 patients. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Ataro Kinoshita from Osaka, Japan. I studied the GPI anchor. Great. And the GPI anchor is the three manoses, all of them from the Dolicol phosphate manos. Great. And uh, when we did the genome wide screening yes. for mutations that affect GPI biosynthesis, mm -hmm. uh, we hit the PMM2. Great. So my question is whether this, uh, you have tested the GP anchor protein expression in your knocking mice? And the second question, have you ever uh, measured the dolical phosphate manus level? Measured, uh, so the first question, whether we have measured this, that particular protein, um, if we did measure, we may not have seen the difference, but I don't quite remember because my scientists did quite a few studies. So I don't particularly remember which particular ones we have checked, but I think we checked hundreds of them. I don't remember if the specific protein you mentioned is in his uh, ELISA or Western blood or LCMS spectrum. But I'll go back and ask him and, and do a quick check. But your second question, I didn't quite catch. Level of dolical phosphate manos. You show this level of GDP. Oh, yes. Yeah. The, the, the level of phosphor manos. Yes, we measure GDP manos. The level of phosphor manos is uh, a lot more difficult to quantitate precisely in these specific matrices we have in cell lysis and, uh, and mouse lysis. You want to know dolpy man? Huh? Dope, dope dolpy man. man. Dolical manos. We, I don't recall we measure that. Yeah. But thank you. So we should go ahead and move ahead. Let's thank um, her again for an excellent talk. Uh, the next speaker is Richard Steet, also from the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center at the University of Georgia. And Rich is going to be talking about uh, new insights into CDG pathogenesis from zebrafish and stem cell models. Okay. Yeah, well, I've refined my title a little bit. We're not, we weren't as far as long, along as I, I would have hoped, but um, I'll give you a good perspective on where we're at. Um, I want to thank HUD for the invitation. Um, this is an honor to be here on, on Rare Disease Day. Having worked on rare diseases for about 15 years now, I, I definitely see the value of all of us getting together, family and scientists, to talk over these issues. Individually, our voices might get lost, but together uh, they can and will be heard. Okay, so 
what I'm going to talk a little bit about, take you through a bunch of different areas here, but first start with uh, why it's important to study disease mechanisms that are associated with CDG. This is an area that I think has been outpaced by the discovery of new diseases. And we need to go back and take a look at what's exactly going on at a molecular level and the ones that are known. And then I'll, I'll share with you our experience over the last probably five or six years modeling uh, CDGs using zebrafish and show you a little bit of published data on PMM2 CDG zebrafish, talk about our efforts to generate new models. And then I'll go into uh, a uh, generation of new tools. These are induced pluripotent stem cells for CDGs in particular, PMM2 CDG, and a new technology that I've uh, been working with several of my colleagues at the CCRC to develop that's going to allow us to profile what's happening at the surface of cells with regard to glycoproteins. Okay, so um, the first main challenge, I think, that, that uh, arises when you deal with CDG disease mechanisms is this first point. That is that we have a single gene defect leads to a defective gene product that's involved in glycosylation. But we know glycosylation is occurring on multiple downstream targets. So the question becomes, which of those targets are affected, and then which of those are relevant to the disease. And there are so few examples where we've been able to connect abnormal glycosylation of specific glycoproteins to phenotypes in a given tissue within uh, the context of CDGs. Um, both those of us that work in glycobiology know it's hard enough to decipher the function of glycans on known proteins, and this is a case where we need to first identify which proteins are responsible. And then I think the other challenge is we need to develop more models, and we saw a good example of this in the previous talk, so that we can test the relevance of specific glycoproteins with altered glycosylation and use both cell and animal models to identify and test therapies. So this next slide, I think, is a good visual representation of, of this problem and this idea of how do we link abnormal glycosylation to phenotype. Are we dealing with finding the needle in the haystack? Perhaps it's the needles in the haystack. But here's a wild type uh, situation where we have normal glycosylation on all the glycoproteins. And then over here, in the case of CDG, we may have any number of abnormally glycosylated proteins. And this may vary with tissues. The question then becomes, which of those needles, or which maybe it's more than one, uh, is actually the one that's responsible for the phenotypes that we see, altered development or homeostasis of different tissues? This is a big question, and it's an important one. I think it's important on a number of different levels. First, identifying the needles in general has value because these would be potential biomarkers for the disease. It also has value on a basic science level uh, to understand in given tissues, how is glycosylation prioritized when uh, the synthesis of precursors or the transfer of those precursors uh, or the elaboration of those glycans once they're on the molecules uh, are there? Why is there a subclass of glycoproteins that's seemingly more affected than others? And I think that's important for us to understand. But the real value in, in taking on this challenge is to identify that green needle. If we can identify what that is, and I'll use an example. Let's say you have abnormal glycosylation of a cell surface receptor, and it leads to its uh, reduced uh, residence at the cell surface and reduced signaling. Well, now that becomes a target. Can we modulate the signaling of that receptor as a way of correcting the phenotypes or treating the disease without actually having to go back and fix that? So in order to really address whether this is causative of the phenotypes, we do need the models. And that's what I'll go into next. Um, so my lab uh, has had a lot of success modeling uh, other uh, rare diseases, including local storage diseases in zebrafish. And I think they provide a, a, a wonderful opportunity for these disorders to address pathogenesis and to think about the functional significance of altered glycosylation. Um, they are a vertebrate organism. There are a number of well-studied developmental processes. They are amenable to biochemistry. So we can go beyond just visualizing what's happening and get into actual uh, identifying molecules. They're also amenable to a variety of different uh, uh, gene knockdown strategies, morpholinos, which are just antisense oligonucleotides, and more uh, recent techniques of gene editing, including Talens and CRISPR, uh, that you can generate stable genetic mutants in, uh, in fish. And they're also amenable to small molecule screening, which is important. 
Okay, so this next slide uh, just shows the uh, biosynthetic pathway for the lipid-linked oligosaccharide precursor for N-glycosylation. <coughs> Colored here in red are all of the different defects that are now represented by type 1 CDGs. This was uh, from a review in 2009. I've actually had to color several of these red. They were originally blue. So again, this is moving along quite quickly. Uh, but this is nice because it highlights where this is feeding in. We have pathway up here uh, that involves PMM2 and MPI that's really in the sugar phosphate metabolism pathway, yet it feeds into this uh, lipid-linked oligosaccharide pathway as well. And then down here, I want to focus on this because I'll mention a few genes in here, is the uh, transfer of the lipid-linked oligosaccharide precursor to uh, nascent polypeptides. Um, and there are not only proteins within this oligosaccharide transferase shown here, but then there are others that are associated with this complex. So our idea when we got into this was really, can we try to maybe model uh, ones that are up in this part, maybe some down here? These might be difficult because studies in yeast have shown you really can't knock those out uh, and get a, a viable organism. But maybe we could with some of these other ones. The other idea, originally, uh, the work that we were doing was with morpholinos. And the idea here is that we can inject in variable amounts of morpholino and maybe overcome this problem that I think was highlighted again in the last talk, where for a lot of diseases, but in particular for CDGs, when you're trying to model these, you have a very narrow window where you'll actually observe phenotypes. You can choose genotypes, uh, and they may end up lethal, or they may end up fully viable. So you're at, you end up with this sort of narrow band. Morpholinos, at least originally for us in zebrafish, gave us an opportunity to tune the dial and get it to where we could actually uh, observe some things uh, about the disease. Okay, so I'll just summarize some of the highlights from, from this work. Uh, we generated PMM2 morphant zebrafish by injecting uh, morpholinos. Oops, sorry. Um, we showed that you can reduce activity to a comparable level of what you see, but as we started to add more morpholino, the activity actually started to go back up, as well as the transcript. We still don't, don't understand what this means. Uh, we described a uh, cartilage uh, defect in these animals. Uh, this is a defect in chondrocyte morphology. So you have sort of a cobblestone appearance. If you now rescue these animals with normal PMM RNA, you can restore this nice sort of stack of pennies appearance. And interestingly, if you reduce the activity of MPI in the PMM2 morphant background, you can get partial rescue, presumably by altering metabolic flux within that sugar phosphate pathway. Um, and then we went on to describe an interesting phenotype, a spinal cord defect. And this is shown right here in these morphins where you had an expansion of these motor neurons within the spinal cord. And this was again rescued. We went on to show that this was actually a particular population of, of motor neurons, the secondary motor neurons. Um, and that's shown here with a stain specific for those neuron, neurons, ZN5. Again, fully rescued. So you have one population that's not affected, another that has kind of an unusual phenotype. We usually think of neurodegeneration. Here we have an inappropriate expansion of a particular class of, of neurons. Now, why is this important? Well, just observing the phenotype starts getting us thinking about what types of molecules or pathways might be responsible for this. So it gives us an opportunity to potentially work from phenotype back to pathway and to molecules. Okay, so what are we doing now? Um, we wanted to generate more stable uh, genetic mutants within this pathway, so we've been using tailins to do that. And the three that we've chosen, these should be finished this year, are STT3A and B, and this one, SSR4, which is a, a, a one of the uh, signal sequence recognition proteins within a complex. The reason we selected these, again, because there, there is some compensation between these two subunits, we'll hear more about that from Reed, and this is uh, actually part of a complex. We had an opportunity to generate a null, but not end up with uh, an animal that wasn't viable. Uh, so we would have a chance to sort of look at this in more detail. Now, what we've done in the meantime is morpholinos to STT3 A and B, um, and that's just shown down here. These are very severely affected animals. We never saw any gross phenotypes at this level when we were dealing with the PMM2 morphins. And it's the same thing over here except there are some differences between 3A and 3B. The craniofacial defect in 3A is actually more pronounced than what we find in 3B. 
This is perhaps because there's a different set, a subset of glycoproteins that's being affected. Um, I think the takeaway from this and our experience with, with zebrafish really is that uh, these pathways, for instance, the transfer of the lipid-linked oligosaccharide precursor, there's not much room for, for error here. If these are defective or missing, you end up with uh, severe phenotypes. When we back up into the sugar phosphate pathway, the, uh, the organism, at least zebrafish, seem to find a way around that. And I think that echoes what our previous speaker showed as well. There's some way in which there's, they can compensate for this and end up uh, moving through towards normal development. Okay, so I want to move on, talk a little bit about what we're doing in cells. Uh, I think we all appreciate that the manifestations of all inherited glycosylation disorders are tissue specific. That is to say that phenotypes in patients with all these types of diseases really only arise in a subset of tissues. And we don't understand the mechanisms for this. Uh, um, why does one cell show an underglycosylation of glycoproteins, whereas another doesn't? The real hindrance here has been that we don't have enough cell models. We work with fibroblasts typically, and they don't tend to show any glycosylation phenotypes. So we wanted to get around this um, by generating induced pluripotent stem cells from these patient fibroblasts and then being able to reprogram them or differentiate them to different cell types. So we would take the patient cell, which would be the fibroblast from a patient, reprogram it using these factors, uh, and then once we have a stem cell population, we can now start to direct the differentiation of this stem cell population to all different types. Um, what can we do then? Well, now we have an opportunity uh, to learn something at a cellular level that we can translate back into animal models or directly use these for, for screening. Uh, the other advantage is you can obtain multiple alleles from different patients, so you can get different genotypes represented. You may even be able to get cells from the families of the carriers, which provide you an opportunity to look at these things in a similar genetic <clears throat> background. All right, so where are we at with this? Um, we originally started uh, trying to reprogram four PMM2 fibroblast lines. Uh, only two were successfully reprogrammed. Uh, and this is all the work done uh, with our collaborator at UGA, Steve Dalton. Uh, but we do end up with two, and we have two unique genotypes. And we've started to do activity assays on these, and we see the same basic decrease in PMM activity uh, in the fibroblasts that we do in the IPS cells, at least for the one, ones that we've tested. What do we really want to do with these cell lines? We would like to now start to differentiate them down to the different pathways, to different cell types like neurons and hepatocytes, and ask at what point do we start to pick up underglycosylation of common glycoproteins. Um, and this is what we're going to do. But the, the real question, too, is, is which, not only which glycoproteins are underglycosylated, but how does this underglycosylation potentially affect cell surface resonance? We think that's really where some of the most easily accessible targets will be, where glycosylation causes a protein to essentially be missing from the cell surface. Those are ones that could have real phenotypic consequences. So in the last little bit, I just want to talk to you about uh, some labeling strategies that we can do to, to take that on. Um, normally, oops, sorry, normally what you would do if you wanted to label cell surface glycoproteins is you might feed them uh, azide-modified sugar precursors. This would allow uh, an azide to get incorporated into an oligosaccharide chain. And then you could come along with another molecule that contains an alkyne uh, linked to a biotin and react that so you've got a handle. Once you've got a handle on that, you can visualize that by Western blot or do things like enrichment and proteomics. And this works okay. Uh, it's shown up here. But uh, we've developed, again, with, with my colleagues at the CCRC, we've developed a new strategy, which we term SEAL. Now, you're probably thinking, this guy was just talking about zebrafish. Now he's talking about SEAL. Uh, bear with me here. Um, SEAL is a little bit different. So what's happening with SEAL is that you're, you're doing, essentially doing glycosylation reactions on the surface of the cell. So you take a recombinantly expressed enzyme, a uh, sile transferase, and then you take a, a modified nucleotide sugar, and you essentially perform this reaction on the surface of the cell. Very different than what you would do metabolically by feeding the cells. Okay, so there are some advantages to SEAL. Because you're using one particular uh, sile transferase, there's selectivity for either N or O glycans, depending on which one you choose. Efficiency would be predicted to be higher because there's no competition 
with endogenous substrates like you get when you feed cells with um, precursors. The one issue is that you have to have acceptors available, and you can get around this by actually stripping the surface of cells of all their natural sialic acid so that you can now install these modified sialic acids. The best part of it, though, is that you should label only cell surface glycoproteins, and that's because neither the glycosyl transferase or the modified nucleotide sugar should cross the membrane. Okay, so traditional seal would involve two steps, where you would first install the azide-containing uh, sialic acid on the surface, and then come along with this second uh, con alkyne-containing molecule and react that. What our colleague at the CCRC, Hurt Jan Boons, uh, uh, conceived is to do this in one step. And remarkably, this works. So instead of doing two steps, now you essentially take your nucleotide sugar and you attach the biotin directly to it. Uh, and you can do this in a couple different ways. So you can attach the biotin at a C5 position or at a C9 position. Now you have the biotin already attached to the sugar. You get around having to do the chemistry. So how does this work? Well, remarkably, one-step seal uh, greatly improves the efficiency of labeling, and that's shown over here. So this is one-step seal, a, this AZ. Metabolic labeling is shown in the middle here, and then two different one-step seal reactions uh, with C5 and C9. And let's just look over here where we've already treated with sialidase. That's what you get with metabolic. That's what you get with uh, two-step seal. This is what you get with one-step seal. So there's a huge increase uh, in, in efficiency, and it's better with C5, uh, the C5 substrate than the C9. So we went on, in, after doing a labeling of HeLa cells, we went on and did an IP with antibiotin and then blotted for known proteins using protein-specific antibodies. And there's a little, there's more loaded in this eluded lane, but what you could see is 100% of what was in there, presumably at the cell surface, has been labeled uh, and, and visualized. So we went on and asked, well, is this really better than the current cell surface biotinylation methods? In fact, it is. So we compared seal using two different enzymes or a combination of these enzymes. This one, ST6-GAL1 being specific for N-linked. This one, ST3-GAL1 uh, being specific for O-linked. And this is, and then compared that to a cell surface biotinylation kit that's lysine-based, this NHS biotin. Now, if you look at the Western blot, you'd say, well, you got a lot more proteins detected with the commercial kit. But if you look over here at those, compare the total proteins to those that are cell surface proteins, you can see, yes, there's 820 proteins that were detected by, by mass spec, but only 124 of those are cell surface proteins. Compare that to SEAL, you have uh, a good bit more uh, proteins, obviously, that are, that are cell surface proteins. But look at the percentages when you do spectral counts. You go from about 15% to almost 90%. So essentially, everything you labeled is cell surface. And I think that really jumps out when you look at these, these graphs uh, of the spectral counts that were recovered. OK, so we can go on and uh, not only just look at this in a static way, but also look at dynamics. And we showed this, if, if you do one-step seal, you're labeling the cell surface beautifully. After a chase, a lot of that labeling goes away, but you can recover a good bit of that labeling and presumably st uh, stability of those proteins when you treat uh, these cells and chase them in the presence of chloroquine. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for this, not only to, to match that technology, labeling technology, with the differentiated cell types that we're gonna generate uh, from the IPS cells. I think there's gonna be some neat discoveries from that. Okay, so uh, the take home messages, I believe that identifying sensitive glycoproteins in the context of CDG is gonna have a big improvement uh, on our understanding of how glycosylation is prioritized and hopefully it leads to new therapies. Uh, the new cell and animal models will facilitate the investigation of CDG pathogenesis, in particular, these zebrafish models, hopefully will allow us to follow phenotype back to sensitive pathways and molecules. Um, and then one-step seal, I believe, is going to provide a great way to profile the cell surface proteome and allow us to look for meaningful differences. So I want to acknowledge uh, the people in my lab, in particular, Suk Ho Yu, who was participated in the seal studies. Nor Claver, who's the postdoc, who's generating the C, uh, CDG zebrafish models, um, and also acknowledge all of my uh, UGA colleagues 
including Lance Wells uh, and Linda Zhao, who did all the proteomics that you saw, Hurt Jan Boons and Kelly Mormon and their lab members for generating the key reagents, Steve Dalton and Michael Kulik, who are involved in uh, the IPS cell production, and Hud Fries and Bobby, who provided us with the cells, and Hud, who has supported the fish work in part on a subcontract from his grant, and of course the NIH for their support as well. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Nice talk. Um, a question about the seal technique. So if, if you want to use it in cell culture, like an IPS cell culture system, and you look at the outside of the cells, you always have interference of the medium that you grow your cells in. Um, so in to, to think of other cells to use, you could perhaps try it straight on patient cells or even patient tissues. So instead of doing your modeling, culturing cells, making IPS cells, you can perhaps establish, a, or we can all establish a, a patient tissue database, like even a biopsy slide, and you can use your seal or develop your seal to go straight to the patient tissue and not do all your complex sure. filtering. Sure, sure. I mean, you, I mean, you're, are you talking about frozen? sections or fixed sections i'm not like sure blood cells straight from the patient frozen sections sure. any anything yeah absolutely and and you know we may have tissues available where you could could try this on yeah no that'd be great i think i think with this technology we're we're really at the tip of the iceberg in terms of applications and we'd be happy to talk to people that are interested in trying that rather than waste time i know in, in making a model Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, one question with the potential benefits of a, a stem cell in uh, trying out new therapies and the limited success in um, getting pluripotent uh, stem cells uh, it, and uh, through the recent uh, um, willingness and also uh, uh, prevalence of IVF and also cord blood banking and so forth. Have you looked into uh, utilizing embryonic stem cells for uh, you know generating nerve cells and other cells that in PMM2 CDG and other types of CDG are known as the tissues where mm -hmm. um, you know the primary phenotypes are? Sure. Yeah. No, we haven't we haven't considered that for for the lysosomal storage diseases that we work on. That that is a potential opportunity, especially to derive mesenchymal stem cells from which you can generate a lot of the cell types that you'd want to look at, osteoblasts and other other cell types. So, no, that's that's a good, a great point. Any other questions? I have a quick one for you, Rich. Yes. Uh, for the efficiency of the step one versus step two, I mean, or, or uh, two-step uh, seals, is it is it the click reaction that is the problem in the two-step? That that's That's the most likely conclusion, is that the chemistry of reacting the azide to the alkyne isn't, it works, but it isn't as efficient. And you could imagine if you had a glycoprotein that was associated with other glycoproteins or even glycans that are packed, tight, tightly packed together, you may not be able to get that bulky alkyne containing group down onto every one of those scenarios. Great, well, let's thank you again. Our next speaker is Reed Gilmore from University of Massachusetts Medical School. Uh, Reed's going to be speaking about uh, mutations in oligosaccharide transferase and their roles in CDG1. I'd like to thank HUD for the opportunity to come to this meeting and get together with all of you and talk about some of the work my lab has been doing in recent years. And so I think one of the concepts that really emerged very early in study of CDG is that Efficient glycosylation of nascent polypeptides by the oligosaccharyl transferase is really essential for normal health, uh, human health and development. And so this is sort of uh, a textbook version of end glycosylation in the ER where proteins are being synthesized by ribosomes, they're passing through a protein transportation channel, and the uh, acceptor glycosylation sites, which are asparagine X3 and or asparagine X are 
seen by the oligosaccharyl transferase, and that's transferring this uh, height of mannose oligosaccharide directly onto the polypeptide before the protein folds. And so, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so the um, uh, the way the glycosylation happens is not quite this simple, and that's probably one of the things that I'm going to be telling you today. And so if this slide looks familiar, it looks like Richard and I had exactly the same idea of, of coloring in the genes that have been identified in the meantime uh, in red. And so the, the point I'm trying to make is back in 2009 when this review article was published, it was an open question as to whether the oligosaccharyl transferase would also have mutations that led to the <laughs> disease of congenital disorders of glycosylation. And so we began uh, working on the oligosaccharyl transferase really using uh, a two model systems, one which is, would be tissues isolated from mammalian organisms, and our second model organism was budding yeast. And so by uh, 2000, we knew the subunit composition of the oligosaccharyl transferase. It turns out it's a very complicated enzyme. In yeast, there are eight subunits. Five of those are encoded by essential yeast genes, so if you make a mutation in those yeast genes, the yeast cannot survive. And this just really brings back to the point that glycosylation is an, an essential reaction, not only in humans, but also very simple organisms like a yeast. And so by 2000, we began to realize, both our lab and Marcus Abey's lab, that one of these subunits, the protein that's called STT3 in yeast, was the catalytic uh, center of this enzyme that did the chemistry that adds the oligosaccharides to the nascent polypeptides. Uh, one thing we routinely, were routinely, routinely doing back uh, at that time was doing what are called blast searches, where we would take protein sequences from yeast and compare them against mammalian databases to identify the oligosaccharyl transferase subunits of humans. And we had uh, discovered a gene we were calling STT3 many years before that doing such a protocol. But in about 2000, one day during a routine blast search, uh, a member of my lab found that there was a second gene that had just come into the databases as the Human Genome Project was being uh, early in its stage, and we were events, uh, he found a piece of a protein, we patched together the whole protein from different sequence reads and realized that in humans there were two uh, catalytic centers of this gene, and we now call those STT3A and STT3B. There was enough database information from just looking at, at mRNA expression in a wide variety of tissues. We soon realized that STT3A and STT3B are expressed in all human tissues. At this point, we've also used a lot of different cell lines, uh, both from humans as, as well as other vertebrates. And so far, we haven't found a, a cell line where both STT3A and ST. 3B are not expressed, and in fact, the expression levels of the two proteins are fairly similar. So how do these proteins end up being uh, incorporated into oligosaccharyl transferase complexes? And, and so what we now know is that each oligosaccharyl transferase has only one copy of a catalytic subunit. It either has STT3A or STT3B. The rest of the complex is made up of two types of subunits. One of, I'm going to, there's a class that I call the shared subunits. And the shared subunits are here in green. There's six different proteins, and they range in size from proteins of about 700 amino acids down to this very tiny protein, which is only 36 amino acids. And each complex contains that full set. Uh, in addition, there's what we call complex-specific accessory subunits. And so proteins, the complex-specific accessory subunits of the STT3A complex are called DC2 and KCP2, and the complex-specific subunits of the STT3B complex are called MAGT1. If it doesn't have MAGT1, it has a protein that's called TUSC3. Those two proteins are related to each other. They're 72% identical in sequence. 
Now, we can do phylogenetics now because there's so much information in DNA and protein sequence databases. And what we learn from that phylogenetic or, uh, information is that all metazoan organisms, and that include, of course includes all vertebrates as well as simpler organisms, with the exception of uh, C. elegans and its closest relatives, have a copy of the STT3 gene, and they also have the accessory subunits. Uh, the other organisms in the world that have an STT3A protein are all multicellular plants. The STT3B complex is present in all metazoan organisms. It's present in all plants. It's present in fungi like budding yeast, and it's present in certain protist organisms like the apicomplexa protists. Simpler protists lack some of the shared subunits. So what we can conclude from that phylogenetic evidence is that this is the ancient form of the oligosaccharyl transferase complex, while the STT3A complex emerged as uh, during early during the evolution of metazoan organisms. And so this really begs the question, if one oligosaccharyl transferase is good enough for bread yeast, why do human organisms need two uh, oligosaccharyl transferases because they actually carry out the same chemical reaction. They take a lipid-linked oligosaccharide and they transfer that to acceptor sites and proteins as they're being made. We, we know there's some uh, interesting uh, enzymatic differences between the two proteins. In fact, what I could tell you is that the STT3A complex is the one that really likes the fully assembled oligosaccharide donor, while this STT3B complex will use underassembled compounds. So why would you want a really careful enzyme and a very sloppy enzyme that carry out the same reaction all within the same cell? And then the other question I want to address today is what are the roles of these accessory subunits for the oligosaccharyl transferase? Now, the approaches that we've been taking over the past 10 years to address these questions are to reduce the amount of expression of various OST subunits in HeLa cells using siRNA technology. Another uh, approach that we've used in collaboration with HUD's lab is to obtain fibroblasts from CD patient, CDG patients, and we've also used a few CHO cell lines that have mutations in specific proteins. And more recently, we've been using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to make HEC293-derived cells that lack either the STT3A gene, STT3B gene, or the various accessory subunits. And I'm going to sort of be mixing all this data in a, a non-chronological fashion because many of the earlier, earlier experiments with, done with siRNAs have been now repeated with the null cell lines. And so this is just an overview of what happens in HeLa cells if we get, try to reduce the amount of either the STT3A complex or the STT3B complex. And so wild-type HeLa cells have more STT3A than STT3B complexes. If we knock down A, uh, the total OST drops by less than twofold, in part because as STT3A disappears, we end up with more STT3B. The same thing happens if we get rid of the STT3B complex. We never see losses down to less than fourfold unless we've tried to knock out both complexes simultaneously. And we seldom do that because those experiments aren't as informative. <coughs> so this is a, a Venn diagram based on analysis of probably 100 glycosylation sites in about 20 different proteins. And the one thing I want to point out to you is the various sectors are not uh, meant to indicate, uh, are not mathematically correct in terms of proportion. It has more to do with fitting the lettering in. So what we find is there are certain glycosylation sites and proteins that are insensitive to loss of either the STT3A complex or the STT3B complex, indicating that either enzyme can modify that site. Certain proteins are really sensitive to loss of the STT3A complex. Others are sensitive to loss of the STT3B complex. And we find that certain sites in glycoproteins are actually modified by both enzymes, uh, but neither enzyme is capable of doing it at 100% efficiency. 
And so with that overview, I want to talk about a couple specific substrates. And uh, this is an example of what our gels, our experiments typically do. We, we take cell lines. These happen to be some of the wild type and null HEC293 cells, pulse label, label them with radioactive amino acid precursors, immunoprecipitate a protein of interest, run it on a gel. And so this is a protein called prosapicin. It has five N linked oligosaccharides attached to it. Uh, if we use an enzyme that takes them all off, this is the mobility of the non-glycosylated protein. So we can count the number of glycans that have got onto the protein. And so in cells that lack the STT3B complex, we get on average two of the five N-linked oligosaccharides are attached to the protein. But what you can see is we get a ladder of bands ranging all the way from those that only lack one oligosaccharide to those that lack all five oligosaccharides. Loss of the STT3B complex or the accessory subunits of that complex have no impact whatsoever on glycosylation of prosapicin. So it's an STT3A substrate. If we look at a diagram of the prosapicin protein, we get some insight into what's going on here because it turns out that prosapicin is a precursor that contains four copies of what's known as a sapicin repeat. Each of these sapicin repeats contains one glycosylation site. All of the red lines down here indicate the disulfide bonding pattern where there's bonds between cysteine residues. And so, uh, this substrate and another similar substrate led to the idea that what's common in the, the fact that they require STT3 is they're cysteine-rich proteins with small and dependent folding domains. And in the case of prosapicin, we know that all of the cysteines in this protein are fully oxidized within about two minutes of, of protein synthesis. The next substrate I want to show you happens to be one that probably many of you are familiar with. It's the protein transferrin. It doesn't have small independent folding domains. There are only two domains in the entire protein, but it happens to be incredibly cysteine rich. And this is the complicated disulfide bonding pattern. That's the position of the two N-linked oligosaccharides. If we do that same sort of experiment in the null cell lines, we find that loss of the STT3B complex has no impact on uh, transferrin glycosylation, while loss of the STT3A complex leads you with transferrin molecules that either lack one or both of the N-linked oligosaccharides. Uh, mutations in some of the accessory subunits of the STT3A complex, notably DC2, phenol copies the loss of the entire complex. And so what this tells us is actually important because uh, it first of all says that the transferrin uh, marker, which is typically used to detect CDG, is exquisitely sensitive to anything that reduces glycosylation by the STT3A complex, but is completely blind to loss of the STT3B complex. Now, the second uh, thing, I, I, so this is sort of a model of what, how, what we think is going on in terms of the STT3A complex in terms of based on these and a large body of other experiments. And so the STT3A complex sits directly adjacent to the protein translocation channel. We can detect larger complexes between the translocation channel and the STT3A complex. And it sits in a mode that it's scanning the growing nascent polypeptide as the polypeptide enters the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum for glycosylation sites. And it modifies those sites in an N-terminal to C terminal mechanism. Uh, we believe this is particularly important for proteins that are rich in cysteine residues uh, that can form disulfides rapidly because the uh, architecture of the active site of the oligosaccharyl transferase is such that it cannot uh, modify sites that are in folded protein domains. It can only modify sites in unfolded domains. Now, if glycosylation worked this way, and, and I should say we also believe it's responsible for glycosylation of most glycosylation sites because loss of the STT3A complex leads to a strong induction of what's called the protein unfolded response pathway due to the accumulation of malfolded proteins in the ER. 
loss of the ESTT3B complex does not induce the UPR pathway. However, as we started studying substrates, we discovered there were certain classes of sites that were frequently skipped by the STT3A complex, and those ex uh, include sites at the extreme C termini of proteins, proteins uh, glycosylation sites where cysteine is the internal residue within a, uh, a sequon, as well as closely spaced sites that contain the less op optimal NXS acceptor sequon. And so uh, that led us to look at po several possible STT3B substrates. A protein called sex hormone binding globulin has two extreme C terminal sites. Uh, normally in wild type uh, cells, uh, we get an average of one and a half glycons on, on that protein. Uh, if we label that cell that protein in cells that lack STT3B, it's almost entirely blocked in glycosylation, loss of the STT3A has no impact. When we test those sites individually, we, we discover that the, the site at the extreme C terminus, NXT, is glycosylated efficiently, but it's still dependent on STT3B. The more internal site is less, is less efficient, but still B dependent. And so the modification order in this case is not dependent upon the order they pass through the protein translocation channel, and the kinetics is, are separable. The, the extreme C terminal site gets modified in a half time of two minutes after the protein is entirely made, while this site is modified much slower and it never reaches completion. And so at this point, I'm going to uh, turn to a collaborative study we did with HUD's laboratory uh, of about three or four years ago. I got an email from HUD indicating that they thought they had identified a patient uh, which had the number CDG001 that had uh, a point mutation in uh, the STT3A gene. It was a homozygous mutation. Uh, this patient presented with a number of, of symptoms that are typical of CDG, uh, and it ha the patient had an abnormal serum transferrin. Uh, when we analyzed fibroblasts from that patient uh, on, by protein immunoblotting, we saw that expression of STT3A was reduced by about the extent we get during an siRNA treatment. Uh, a month or two later, I got a second email from HUD indicating that Bobby Eng had found a patient that uh, appeared to have a homozygous mutation in the STT3B gene. It's a splice site mutation leading to a lower amount of mRNA, but the protein that's made is totally normal. And this patient also had severe symptoms and, and unfortunately was deceased by age four, even before the mutation was actually tracked down. And so I'm just going to show you uh, a little bit of the data we obtained, again, using the same two model substrates. Uh, this uh, second lane here is la labeling of prosapicin in the STT3A patient fibroblasts, and you see we get that same ladder of oligosaccharides that happens if we treat HeLa cells with STT3A siRNA. Uh, the B patient has no problem with glycosylation of that protein, uh, nor do control human fibroblasts. This is uh, labeling of the STT3B marker. Uh, and uh, in this case, the patient has uh, severe underglycosylation of that particular protein. So what we learned from this is that human patients have to, uh, humans for normal health and development have to have both the STT3A complex and the STT3B complex because the two proteins together are necessary for, for full glycosylation of human proteins. And so the next topic I want to really address quickly is the possibility that OST subunit genes could be modifiers of CDG that are caused by mutations in the dolichol assembly pathway. What we wanted to do when we first started this experiment was to pick an ALG gene, one responsible for adding some of the glucose, the first glucose residue, and do simultaneous siRNA treatments. And, and in fact, uh, we were not able to get those siRNA treatments to work very well. So what we picked was instead uh, some cell lines we'd got, one of which was from HUD, one 
from another person and, and started testing our panel of substrates. And we found that the uh, patients, the, the cells from CHO, a particular mutant, were much more defective in STT3B uh, proteins than the human cell line was. And eventually we tracked this down to learn that the, the CHO line carried a second mutation that reduces the expression of the STT3B complex. So we think that both within tissues as well as between patients, OST subunit expression will modify the phenotype. Now, what about the shared subunits? Well, one would predict, based on other model organisms, that no mutations in shared subunits would be embryonic lethal. Less severe mutations <coughs> would cause glycosylation defects that would be adequately diagnosed by abnormal serum transferrin. So far, only two of the uh, genes are known to cause mutations. HUD's lab discovered a mutation in, in the DDOST gene, and this is clearly leading to one form of CDG. I'm going to mention very briefly, uh, because I, I'm clearly going going to go over otherwise, that we've, we have studied the accessory subunits of the STT3A complex. So far, there are no patients that have mutations in these genes. These genes help localize the OST next to the translocation channel. Um, and the mutations in DC2 or KCP2 should be adequately diagnosed by serum transferrin abnormalities. The, the last thing I want to tell you really about is these accessory subunits in the STT3B complex, where one either has a copy of MAGT1 or TUSC3. And so the summary at the top of this slide just talks about what we've done with the HEC293 derived cells. What we found is in the HEC293 derived wild type cells, we see expression of MAGT1. We can't dis detect expression of TUSC3. However, if we get rid of the MAGT1 gene, we can now see the TUSC3 protein. And the amount of TUSC3 that's then being expressed is leads to fairly normal glycosylation of the STT3B substrate. If we get rid of STT3B gene, neither TUSC3 or MAGT1 are stable, and we get a severe glycosylation defect. Loss of both of those genes causes a glycosylation defect that's almost as bad as losing the entire complex. Now, what I can tell you about MAGT1 and TUSC3 is they're homologous to yeast proteins that have a defined role in end glycosylation. These proteins are members of the thyroidoxin family. They have the ability to uh, do disulfide bond chemistry, and we think they form transient mixed disulfides with substrates. Uh, uh, it turns out that MAGT1 uh, we know that they're exclusively localized to the ER in multiple cell types. A and finally, that while MAGT1 is widely expressed in different human tissues, expression of TUS3 is more restrictive. Uh, finally, we know that loss of either one of those proteins has no impact on transferrin glycosylation. So the transferrin assay is also blind to uh, defects in those two genes. Now, it would be remiss if I didn't tell you that there's an entirely alternative literature concerning MAGT1 and TUSC3. If you were to, to do a, a, a search of uh, PubMed, you would find that for each paper on glycosylation, there are two, th two or three papers saying that these are cell surface magnesium transporters, and the number of review there's probably 40 review articles saying that that's also the case. Uh, why do we really care? Oops, uh, is that, oh, that's interesting. Oh, is that uh, mutations in these genes cause human diseases. Loss of the TUSC3 gene causes autosomal recessive metal retardation. Uh, it has clinical symptoms that are much, much less severe uh, than typical CDG patients. Loss of the MAGT1 gene causes X-Men disease, which is an X-linked immunodeficiency uh, where the patients have chronic Epstein-Barr virus infections and neoplasia. And so uh, rather than show additional uh, experiments, I just want to try to explain, first of all, why the loss of either of these genes have different phenotypes than typical CDG. And so 
To start off, we can, as far as we can tell, using our panel of substrates, MAG-T1 and TUSC-3 can, 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 can be considered as being redundant within a, a single model cell system. And so either protein can do the job. But let's consider the possibility that within a, a patient, uh, that the MAG-T1 gene is defective while the TUSC-3 is normal. Now, the expression levels of these two proteins are different between tissues, so the end result of that is that within a given tissue, one is going to, if that tissue primarily expressed MAG-T1, you're going to get reduced activity of the STT3B complex. Uh, if that tissue primarily expresses TUSC3, the STT3B complex will be perfectly normal. As a consequence of that, you're going to get reduced, express, uh, reduced glycosylation of a subset of the glycoproteins that are normally uh, glycosylated by the STT3B complex, and this can translate to various uh, disease symptoms. And this contrasts strongly with what happens uh, in an STT3B deficiency because reduction of the STT3B complex has a much larger number of targets. And, and so it's, it's, as Richard pointed out, uh, in the zebrafish models, loss of STT3B has a devastating impact on development of the fish. And so at this point, I just want to acknowledge the people in my laboratory who have done this work, most of it, what I showed you today, was done by Shitesu Shrimal and Natalia Cheropanova. Earlier work with siRNAs was done with Catalina. We're grateful to, for the collaboration with HUD's lab out here. Uh, thank you. We have time for one quick question. Uh, if not, we're running a little late, so I think we'll go ahead and move ahead. Okay. If you have questions for Reed, I encourage you to ask them uh, at lunchtime. So I am the last speaker in this session. Uh, my name is Bob Hoffwanger again. I'm from the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center. I'm going to hand the microphone over to HUD, and he can uh, monitor my time because I know I'm keeping you all from lunch. So we'll try to finish this as quickly as possible. And I'll be really tough on it. Really you. tough. <laughs> right. So I do, I do want to thank HUD uh, for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. In fact, uh, HUD gave me his time slot, That's, uh, which I, I really am honored uh, uh, that, that he let me. Uh, we, we talked about this in December. We were at a review at uh, NIH, um, and I mentioned that I wanted to come to this meeting. And he said, well, we, don't, we may not have money, but if you want to come, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give you my spot. So I really appreciate that. Again, it's, it, it's an honor to be here. Uh, so we're going to talk about a different type of glycosylation for a little while. Um, I, I work on what's called protein o fucosylation So this is direct, uh, addition of a fucose, uh, fucose monosaccharide, directly to protein. Uh, it's at an O-linkage to the hydroxyls of serine or threonines. So you've been hearing about N-link glycosylation for the last three talks. So this is, I mean, to change the mindset a little bit, this is a completely different pathway uh, for glycosylation. Uh, this type of glycosylation occurs uh, uniquely on uh, small protein motifs. Uh, uh, both um, either a, um, a, a thrombospondin type 1 repeat or a, what, what I'll be abbreviating as a TSR, and that fucose is being added by the enzyme protein o fucosyl transferase 2, um, uh, or uh, we can put a fucose on an epidermal growth factor-like repeat or an EGF repeat, and that fucose would be added by protein o fucosyl transferase 1. So POFA1 and POFA2 are what we'll talk about. There are diseases that are associated with, with each of these um, uh, fucosylation pathways. We're going to start with um, uh, looking at uh, what's called Peters Plus syndrome, uh, which is a de defect in actually a, a, a glucosyl transferase that adds a glucose to the fucose on these thrombospondin 1 repeats. And then we'll look at a few diseases um, that are associated with defects in the fucosyl, the POFA1 uh, enzyme. Okay, so to uh, introduce uh, Peters Plus syndrome. So this is an, a rare autosomal uh, recessive disorder. Uh, the patient's um, uh, one of the primary defects is an anterior eye chamber defect, which is known as uh, Peter's anomaly. This is a developmental uh, uh, defect where the, the lens does not completely separate from the cornea. And so you can see all of these patients have um, a, a, a clouding of, of, of the cornea. Uh, in, addition, in addition to the Peter's anomaly, that's why it's called Peter's Plus, uh, they have bone growth defects, so they're, they're, both of the long and the short bones are not growing properly. Um, uh, they have cr uh, characteristic craniofacial defects, uh, frequently associated with congenital heart defects, um, and um, often with a cleft pellet or, or cleft lip. Uh, in 2006, 
the gene uh, that is mutated uh, in these patients uh, was identified. Uh, it was uh, identified as a putative glycosyl transferase because they didn't know what it encoded for at the time, and they called it B3-GAL-TL, which means beta-3 galactosyl transferase-like. So it looked like a galactosyl transferase, and so that's that's what they named the gene uh, um, uh, when it was first uh, reported, again in 2006. Um, there are a number of mutations uh, in, uh, in that gene, uh, which have now been associated with the disease, and there are a variety of mutations. You can have complete genomic deletions. There are a variety of truncation mutations, which is what these asterisks are for. There are splice size mutations, and there's also just point mutations. And so a variety of different uh, types of mutations uh, seem to, to result in this disease. Um, uh, in 2006, we also identified what that beta-3 galactosyl transferase-like gene really does. It's not a galactosyl transferase, but it's a glucosyl transferase. So again, it's actually a beta-3 glucosyl transferase, and it's involved in the glycosylation of these thrombus bond repeats, the, the TSRs. So this shows the, the glycosylation pathway uh, for addition of those sugars. This is what a thrombus bond of type 1 repeat looks like. I'll show you a, a domain model in just a second. The first enzyme that adds the fucose, as I mentioned before, is called POFUT2. We identified that gene in 2006. 2006 was a really big year for this pathway. Um, and again, it adds the fucose directly to a serine or threonine in that thrombus bond repeat. Um, and then the beta-3 glucosyl transferase, which was, again, initially identified by the Narmatsu lab and the, and the Hofstinghe lab, um, adds, uh, puts a glucose on top of that fucose to make a mature disaccharide. And so uh, what is a thrombus bond on type 1 repeat? Uh, well, as its name implies, it was originally discovered in a protein called thrombus bondin, uh, thrombus bondin 1 in particular. This is a modular protein. It's got lots of different domains. Uh, but in the middle of it, it's got three of these uh, TSRs, thrombus bond on type 1 repeats. Uh, and back in 2001, Jan Hofstinghe's group demonstrated that all three of these TSRs are modified by that glucose fucose disaccharide, actually at the same spot, uh, always on a hydroxy amino acid right next to a cysteine, uh, right there. Uh, uh, and so that was the first demonstration that the thrombus bond repeats were actually glycosylated. Uh, this is a, uh, just a cartoon of what a thrombus bond repeat looks like. Uh, there are about 60 amino acids long, so each of these circles is an amino acid. They're defined by the presence of six conserved cysteines forming three disulfide bonds in a very specific pattern. And comparison of sites of glycosylation on a number of proteins have led to a consensus sequence, which is shown here. So basically, a hydroxy amino acid immediately adjacent to the second conserved cysteine. You need two amino acids here uh, and, and a few amino acids afterwards. Uh, thrombus bond repeats are often uh, modified uh, with semen oscillation. It's a different type of glycosylation, which I won't talk about today. Uh, but there's also a consensus sequence for that, which is a tryptophan XX tryptophan. Uh, so again, uh, multiple carbohydrate modifications can occur on these TSRs. Okay. Uh, because there's a consensus sequence, you can do database searches, and you can predict uh, how many proteins in the human genome might be modified. So we're using this consensus sequence and, and searching for proteins that have TSRs, uh, and they have that consensus sequence in that context. Uh, and there's about 40, there are 49 proteins in the human genome predicted to, to have this modification. The ones in red are ones that my lab or other labs have demonstrated are, in fact, modified uh, with the disaccharide. Uh, about half of the proteins on this list are members of the Adam TS family. These are uh, extracellular matrix proteases. And so they are secreted into the matrix and they remodel extracellular matrix. And then about five or six of them are Adam TS like proteins, which are similar domain structures, uh, but they don't have a protease domain. This again is a thrombus bond and type 1 repeat, a crystal structure of one. You can see the three disulfide bonds here. And again, you can see that the disaccharide is being added to a tip. And that's where the consensus sequence is, right down there. Okay, so uh, several years ago, in collaboration with Bernadette Holdner at Stonebrook University, we eliminated the, the first gene, the fucosyl transferase, um, in mice, and, and the mice die. We have severe embryonic lethality. Uh, so obviously, fucosylation of some of these targets is, is important. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, um, but it's a severe defect. It affects gastrulation, so early, early in uh, embryogenesis. And so our hypothesis um, is that the, um, the embryonic lethality and the defects that are seen in Peters Plus patients are due to defects in one or more of those targets, so that's those 49 uh, proteins that I, that I put on the, on the pre previous slide. And so early on, we, we started thinking about what, what could a fucose do uh, on, on these proteins, and we actually got a clue to that when we were first characterizing the fucosyl transferase back in 2006, because we, we had to develop an in vitro assay to be able to detect uh, the activity. And so we could make a, a thrombus bond and repeat. This this is actually the third thrombus bond repeat from human thrombus bond in one. It's known to be fucosylated in vivo. Uh, we can make it in bacteria, and bacteria doesn't add the fucose, and so we can use that as a substrate in vitro. We can mix it with the enzyme, and we can see transfer of fucose um, over time. 
um, actually in, in a concentration dependent manner. But we also noticed that when we break the disulfide bonds and so we linearize that, that uh, protein sequence, it's no longer a substrate. And so this is a really unique characteristic of an enzyme. It can tell the difference between a folded structure and an unfolded structure. Um, uh, in addition, we, we noted that the enzymes, both the fucosotransferase and the glucosotransferase, are actually localized to the ER. And so putting those things together, we started to, to hypothesize that possibly these enzymes are involved in a novel uh, quality control pathway. Because, uh, again, the, the fucosotransferase can distinguish uh, folded from unfolded, which is the basic characteristic uh, of quality control. Um, and they're localized to the folding compartment. So we've examined this uh, in some detail. And I'm just going to show you a couple of slides, because this was actually published last year in Current Biology. Uh, but uh, th this is doing secretion assays, um, where we're knocking down uh, either the fucosyl transferase or the glucosyl transferase in, an, in a HEC293 T cell. And we're using several targets um, that we know are glycosylated. So I've already told you about thrombospondin 1. Uh, we're using Adam TS like 1, Adam TS like 2, and Adam TS 13 here um, as, as other targets. We know that all of the predicted sites of fucosylation are, in fact, stoichiometrically modified by the O fucose disaccharide. And so the, the modification is, is, is quite robust. Uh, so uh, on, on the left side of the gels, you see uh, the cell lysates. On the right are the media fractions. We use IgG as a control because it has no thrombospondin type 1 repeats in it. And you can see that, it, that when we knock down uh, POFA2 or glucosotransferase, it has no effect on IgG secretion. Uh, but you see a profound secretion defect on all of the POFA2 targets um, when we knock down POFA2. Interestingly, we see a selective effect um, of, of uh, knocking down the glucosotransferase. So it seems like when we eliminate the glucosotransferase, it'll affect secretion of some proteins, uh, but not others. This is actually interestingly consistent with what we see in the phenotypes of the Peters Plus patients. And so Peters Plus patients, uh, one of the, one of the uh, phenotypes they display is brachydactyly, short stubby fingers. Um, uh, mutations in Adam TS like 2 cause a human disease called geliophysic dysplasia. Those patients also show uh, brachydactyly. Uh, and again, uh, when we knock down the glucosyl transferase, we see a loss of secretion of, uh, of um, Adam TS like 2, so suggesting that that phenotype in the Peters Plus patients may be caused uh, by, by a loss of uh, function of uh, Adam TS like 2. In contrast, uh, Peters Plus patients do not display clotting, clotting defects. Uh, Adam TS 13 is the von Willebrand factor protease. Uh, mutations in that uh, cause an inherited uh, disease, or actually an acquired disease. There's an, immuno, uh, an, an, an autoimmune disease also causing this, a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Uh, and again, we do not see a decrease in Adam TS13 secretion uh, in these assays, again, consistent with the phenotypes that we see uh, in, in the Peters Plus patients. Okay, uh, so, so apparently the, these enzymes are at least involved in folding um, of these proteins and secretion. Uh, we wanted to know, um, uh, actually, at the level of a sin, single thrombospondin uh, type 1 repeat, the level of a single TSR, are the sugars actually doing something to the stability of the protein? And so we developed an in vitro folding assay, an uh, unfolding assay. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we can make a thrombospondin repeat. This, again, is the third thrombospondin repeat from human thrombospondin 1. We can make it in bacteria. It actually folds in the bacteria, which is fortuitous. That's why we could use it as a substrate in the earlier assays. We could purify it and then run it on an HPLC column. And so we see a nice uh, peak uh, showing that it's a, 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 a um, pure species. If we take that same protein and we just reduce it adding, by adding dithiatriotol and then rerun the HPLC column, we see it shift over about two minutes. Um, so we can actually detect whether something, whether a thrombospondin repeat is folded or unfolded just by running it on an HPLC column. And so we decided to use this as an, in an assay. Uh, basically, we're going to take the, the thrombospondin repeat, put it into dithiatriotol, and over time, we'll just acid trap the, the proteins. Uh, and we can uh, run them on, uh, over time, run them on the HPLC, and you can see disappearance of the folded form and appearance of the unfolded form. And so we can plot those. There's the, there's the appearance of unfolded and the disappearance of the folded. And so we can monitor the rate of unfolding, the stability, if you will, um, of this thrombospondin repeat. Then we can put the fucos on because we have the enzyme, and we repeat the exact same experiment. You can see that we slow down uh, the unfolding of the thrombospondin repeat. You see these, shift, these curves shift over to the, uh, to the right. And again, addition of the glucose shifts them even further. Further. And so these, these data strongly argue that addition of this disaccharide is stabilizing the folded form uh, of that thrombospondin repeat. Um, 
So does this matter? Uh, well, uh, if it does, um, then you would expect that when, when you actually do a folding assay and, and then you add the enzymes in, that maybe it would speed up the, the rate of folding. And so we did that. So we can, we can actually take the unfolded thrombospondyl repeat and put it in a redox system uh, in a test tube. That's just a mixture of oxidized and reduced glutathione that'll allow formation uh, and breaking of disulfide bonds. And over time, you can see uh, we actually start to form the folded form. It all, it's going slowly, but it, but it actually works. If we add the fucosyl transferase to that, it really doesn't change uh, much. But if we add GDP fucose so that the enzyme can add a fucose to the thrombospondyl repeat, you can see we can see a significant acceleration of the formation of the folded form. This just shows you that the rate of, of uh, folding actually does accelerate, which is what you would expect if it's actually stabilizing uh, the folded form. So what we think is going on um, is, uh, again, the, the TSRs are going to be uh, made uh, off of a ribosome. They're going to be a linear chain of amino acids. They have to get to a folded form, and they're going to go through a folding pathway. We don't know what that folding pathway is, but there's going to be intermediates in that. And this is an equilibrium um, of uh, formation, making and breaking of disulfide bonds. Eventually, you're going to get to something that looks like a folded thrombospondyl repeat. We know that the enzyme will recognize that and fucosylate it, and it will actually drive uh, the, the equilibrium uh, towards that folded form. It's going to stabilize that, so it, it'll prevent the protein from going back into the folding equilibrium. And we think the glucosyl transferase does the same thing. Uh, again, the interesting thing about the glucosyl transferase is, as I mentioned, it seems to be selective for some proteins over others. And so we're very interested in determining what proteins the glucosyl transferase is required uh, for secretion, because we think those will be the relevant uh, uh, targets uh, uh, to help develop therapeutics for Peters Plus syndrome. Okay, so now I want to move on to the glycosyl, the fucosylation of the epidermal growth factor like repeats by the fucosyl transferase POFIT-1. We're going to look at two diseases, uh, one that's been reported by other groups uh, called uh, Dowling-Dagos disease, um, and the other one is a, is a collaboration, again, with HUD. Um, on, a, on a CDG patient. And again, I, I, I want, to, want you to get a, a sense from looking at these two different diseases and comparing them, the differences in phenotypes you see by expression levels um, uh, of active uh, enzyme. Uh, so again, uh, we're, we're talking about this enzyme. So this, this is an epidermal growth factor like repeat. Again, it, it's a little bit smaller than the thrombospondin type 1 repeat. It's, it's got, uh, um, it's only about 40 amino acids, but it's still got six cysteines, three disulfide bonds. And the fucosyl transferase POFA1 adds the fucose represented by the red triangle directly to a serine or threonine immediately adjacent to a cysteine. Okay, so that, that's what this enzyme does. Again, there's, there's lots of other types of glycosylation that also occur on EGF repeats. We, we study all of these, and actually there are genetic deficiencies in many of these enzymes that we're, that we're interested in, in following up on. But we're going to focus today just on the POFA1. Okay, so several years ago, there was a report um, that uh, mutations in POFA1 uh, cause uh, uh, what's called generalized uh, dowling dagos disease, or DDD. Um, again, it's a rare, this is a rare autosomal uh, 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 genodermatosis. Uh, again, this has only been reported so far in Chinese families, which may or may not be relevant. Um, it's, a, it's a pigmentation defect, and so uh, either both are hyper or hypopigmentation of the flexures. And typically, it's a, um, a truncation mutant, which would presumably be an inactive uh, form uh, of the enzyme in one allele. And so these are heterozygote patients. So th these, are, these are dominant mutations. Um, uh, again, so it suggests that this is a haploinsufficiency. If you reduce the gene dosage of um, uh, pilfal one by half, uh, you actually see this phenotype. Um, uh, in this paper, they went on to show, uh, using the zebrafish system, uh, that uh, uh, morpholino knockdown, the type of stuff that Rich was talking about before, also causes some pigmentation defects in, in, in fish. Although it's, it's important to point out that, uh, again, POFA1 has been knocked out in mice. It was knocked out by Pamela Stanley's group back in 2003. They didn't report any pigment, pigmentation defects in the heterozygote mice. Uh, again, they didn't look for it because this came out afterwards, and so it would be worth going back and looking at those mice in some more detail. But nonetheless, it, it was not commented on there. And I did want to point out that, again, the homozygous deletion of POFA1 in mice causes a severe embryonic lethality with defects in the notch pathway. Again, so POFA1 is required for notch activity, and, and notch is involved in early stages of development in most tissues. And so this is just a picture from the Stanley paper, because when you knock out the fucus of transferase in, in a mouse, you see law, you see uh, defects in heart formation, cardiogenesis, somite formation, uh, vasculogenesis, and neurogenesis. And so it's a, it's a pretty severe embryonic lethal uh, phenotype. Okay, so um, now I, that, that's sort of his background to, for this patient. So this is a patient that, um, that, that again, HUD sent me an email, and uh, uh, the uh, clinicians had identified a homozygous uh, mutation uh, in this gene uh, in, in the patient uh, CDG402. 
again, uh, a, a broad array of clinical features uh, in, in this patient. Um, some of them I've highlighted in red, liver defects and heart defects are potentially consistent with some effect on the notch pathway, but a lot of things uh, that uh, potentially are not uh, consistent with the notch pathway. It's interesting, I, I did want to point out, although notch is a major target for POFA1, there are about 100 targets in the human genome. So there's a lot of proteins predicted to be modified. In fact, several of the co coagulation factors are directly modified by that enzyme. So the, some of those effects could be due, due to that. So the molecular features, the um, uh, it's a point mutation, uh, serine to, uh, to leucine at 162 in the gene, it's a homozygous mutation. Again, both parents uh, are heterozygous uh, for, for that mutation. Um, so we've just characterized the cells from these patients uh, as, as an initial look. Uh, so this is looking at mRNA levels of the POFA1 in the, in the patient uh, fibroblast versus control fibroblast, and there's, there's no large difference there. So it seems like the messenger <laughs> RNA is normal. We've done Western blots to, to look at protein levels. And uh, you, see, you see equivalent amounts of protein expressed in the patient versus the control fibroblast. But interestingly, you see that the, the protein is migrating faster in the, in the patients than it is um, in, in the controls, which again, we should have actually guessed when we looked at the, where the mutation is. Uh, so again, this is the sequence of human POFA1. Um, uh, the mutation is right here in that serine. You see it's right, and it's going to eliminate an in glycosylation site. Human POFA1 is predicted to have two in link glycosylation sites. These are actually conserved in all of the mammalian uh, POFA1s, but not in all POFA1s. In fact, uh, the only crystal structure we have of this enzyme is from the C. elegans enzyme. It has no in link glycosylation, which is why they used it for the crystal structure. But if I, if I put where this site is on the, that structure, it's over here, okay? Uh, that, that's where that in glycan would be. This is the active site. You can actually co-crystallize with GDB pucose. You can see that this is where the catalysis is going to occur. There's a large cavity right here, which is where the EGF repeat is going to bind. Okay, so it's outside of, of the catalytic domain. Uh, so it's not it's not exact it's not um, uh, blocking or, or interfering with that. This is just confirming that when we treat with PNGSF and uh, trim everything down to um, uh, no glycans, the proteins migrate at the uh, at the appropriate molecular weight. So that just confirms that that there is in fact a loss of a single uh, in glycan uh, on the patient's, uh, um, um, patient's POFA1. So we've characterized activity uh, of, of, this, uh, of this enzyme. So this is just doing extracts of, um, of, the, of the fibroblast. And you can see there's a profound deficiency in the fucus cell transferase activity. These are the, these are the controls. Uh, we, we use another enzyme that also modifies EGF repeats, POGLIT1, uh, as a control. And you can see that that activity is fine in the patient. Uh, we've expressed the protein, um, overexpressed the protein and introduced the mutation and compared, done some kinetics to, to compare uh, how um, it does compared to, to wild type. You can see just in a, a concentration dependence for EGF repeats, there is some activity, it's low activity, uh, but it's, it's significantly reduced. When we do the kinetic analysis, uh, there's a large, significant Vmax defect. Uh, there's actually a large, about a tenfold uh, uh, change in the affinity for the EGF repeat also, which again, we, we, what we think is happening is that the, 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 the loss, loss of the glycan at this position is somehow affecting uh, the shape of that large cavity where the EGF repeat is binding, and that's probably what's uh, causing the defect. There's, a very, there's essentially no defect in the KM for the, for the GDP fugus, so that, that GDP fugus binding site seems to be unaltered uh, in, the, in the core of the enzyme. We've also just done overnight incubations of the enzyme with an EGF repeat and analyzed the products by mass spectrometry. Again, this is just an extract on ion chromatogram showing the wild type protein will, at various concentrations, will add a fucose. This is, this, the, the black line is the unmodified TSR and the red line is the, is the fucosylated TSR. You can see, oh, if we do an overnight incubation uh, with the large amount of enzyme, we can get full fucosylation. So there's, a, there's residual activity um, uh, in, uh, in, these, um, in that enzyme. So just to summarize, uh, for the TSR fucosylation, um, these two enzymes, POFA2 and the glucosyltransferase, participate in a non-canonical ER quality control pathway necessary for TSR folding. Um, and uh, it appears that loss of the glucosyltransferase in Peters Plus syndrome is, is causing a secretion defect in a subset of the POFA2 targets. And again, we're very interested in identifying which, which of those targets, uh, which targets those are. And for the EGF uh, repeat O fucosylation, uh, uh, the, the dowling dagos disease is caused by a uh, um, uh, haploinsufficiency of POFA1, uh, again, reported in Chinese families to date. Um, and this point mutation uh, we see in the CDG402 patient um, uh, eliminates an in glycosylation site, um, which causes a significant loss in, in POFA2, uh, I'm sorry, POFA1 activity uh, with a, a multi, multi systemic disorder. 
These are the people that have done the work. Uh, so Hideyuki Takeuchi in my lab is a research associate that did all of the biochemistry on POFIT-1 and the EGF repeats. Uh, and Deepika Vasudevan um, uh, has done all of the Peters Plus uh, work, and I've been collaborating with Bernadette Holdner for a number of years on the POFIT-2 project. And again, uh, I want to acknowledge the, the collaboration with HUD and Bobby uh, to get the cells for the CDG-402 patient. And here we are eating dinner somewhere. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Bob. Uh, we've got time for a couple questions. Bob, a couple of related questions. The issue of haploinsufficiency, has that, uh, uh, have anyone, has any, do you know if it's been confirmed that the mutated or truncated versions don't have like dominant negative activity? And also whether your human patient in collaboration with HUD has the dowling degas phenotypes? Right. So, no, we, we don't know either of those yet. So the, the, uh, the DD, we, we've expressed some of the DDD mutants in our lab. To, I mean, most of them are truncation mutants and, and really are not predicted to make functional protein at all. And so they're not seen. In fact, there's nonsense mediated message decay uh, for, for some of the mutations. But, uh, but a few that we have expressed, we don't see any activity in the mutations that we've seen. Um, but the, a big question is, you know, does it have an effect? That, I mean, is the protein being made? Is it binding to notch or something and, and retaining it? And so we, we don't know the answer to that. So that's a great question. And the same thing for, for these. Um, we, we actually, I mean, we're doing the same thing that Reed does. We, we've made CRISPR-Cas knockouts of, um, of all of these genes in 2 3 T cells. And so we can start doing some rescue experiments and see whether that's actually the case. Great question. Okay, any more questions? Oh. With the extent of those defects, I mean, you're basically getting loss of secretion right. of several proteins. I, I'm surprised it isn't more profound uh, based on how many things are, are essentially missing. I mean, thrombospondin is a known activator of TGF beta. Essentially, have none of it being secreted. I guess sure. that could depend on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but a thrombospondin one knockout is viable. Okay, so I mean, it, it does have some angiogenesis defects, but again, and, and actually they're more susceptible to cancer, uh, but it's a completely viable uh, mouse. So yeah, I mean, um, we do see tissue-specific uh, effects, uh, and I mean, early in embryo, I mean, we, we have very good candidates for, like in the POFA2 knockout mouse, we have very good candidates for what's causing the embryonic fatality. We, we're pretty sure we know what those targets are. Um, uh, and. Uh, and again, you know, the, it looks like for the bone growth defects, Adam TS like two is a very good candidate uh, for uh, causing bone growth defects in, in Peters Plus. So again, I mean, the nice things we, in contrast to the inland clock oscillation world that has lots of targets, we have a pretty limited list, and 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 there are um, many of the Adam TS and Adam TS like there are already known human deficiencies in those in in those uh, genes, uh, and so we can sort of look at the phenotypes in those patients and map them to the Peters plus, and start to you know sort out what might be um, causing the, the the cluster of phenotypes we see in a Peters plus patient. And I think that's really one of the important points. What right. you just brought up is that with n glycosylation, even though we've got a lot of disorders, there's thousands of proteins here, you can begin to focus in on those. And that's why I was really uh, um, glad that Bob uh, accepted the invitation to come. And we will pay for this. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks again, Bob. And we're going to do lunch, which I'm sure everybody's happy about. So can you all come back at 1.30? Lunch is out there, and it's nice outside in case you haven't noticed. And you can probably find some place out there to sit down and have lunch. Thank you. See you at 1.30.